Isn't it about time for somebody's favorite radio program? Yeah. 97.3 ESPN presents The Sports Bash with Mike Gill. When I'm driving, I got a guy on the radio who talks to me. I can't see him, but he talks to me. Now, live from inside the Ocean Casino Resort Studio, here's Mike Gill. You think you know me? Josh Hennig filling in for Mike Gill for one more day on 97.3 ESPN FM, the 97.3 ESPN mobile app powered by First Bank of CIL City. Mike Gill is on his way back from London, and we have a special guest joining me in the studio, Nick Earnshaw from the Shift Podcast and producer on the weekends for Billy Schwein, the locker room on 97.3 ESPN. Nick, you gotta let the people know that Mike Gill's not here because we don't play Mike Gill's music for the intro when That's he's true. not here. That's true. That's very true. Josh, it's great to be with you. Mike's, I guess, coming across the pond as we speak. Uh, I can't wait to see him back tomorrow, but I'm excited to be with you for the next couple of hours here. We got a busy show, four hour tour to get into. Phillies weekend in London, Eagles takeaways from. What was a uh, interesting mini camp? We'll call it. Plus, uh, the Dan Hurley news just dropped about ten minutes before we hit the radio, and I got some thoughts on that a little bit later in the show. Uh, to be honest, Nick, the NBA Finals have been very disappointing, and the viewership is pretty low for it. It's actually the worst watch NBA Finals in a decade, they say. So uh, we'll get into that, I'm sure, at some point. Uh, have you watched any of the Stanley Cup Final? I watched a little bit on Saturday night. Yes, game one I watched a little bit. Uh, the NBA Finals, I- I'm with you. The Dan Hurley news is has been taken over more than the NBA Finals itself. Like, like that's been talked about way more than the actual games, the actual finals with the Celtics and the Mavericks because they've been kind of snoozers, to be honest. The first two games of the finals have been snooze fest, clearly. And, I, you know, I don't want to see Boston win. I mean, if you're around here, you're a Sixers fan, you don't want to see Boston win. But they're up two games to none. Hasn't really been talked about as much. The Hurley news has kind of taken over the NBA fear as of now josh but let's get to the phillies because the phillies are obviously you know the the biggest for us locally in the weekend and what, what a wild weekend it was because uh, nick i know a lot of businesses in south jersey they had special openings special events special activities just for the london games so it's always great to see the local community come together and create a uh at home phillies environment for the team overseas and I want to get into my quick couple takeaways from the weekend. Number one, the Bryce Harper moment on Saturday may be at the top of the montage if this team does go back to the World Series this year. You know, you always have that, like, you know, the Phillies rain delays, you know, the montages yeah. they show of, like, you know, remember this Phillies team? You know, I think that the Harper hitting the home run – with the special bat, which I'm guaranteeing you, if they put that up for auction right now for charity, Nick, it's probably get a half a million dollars. Oh, bat. yeah, that, that's going to go way up in price. Yeah, so, but, but the home run specifically, you know, Harper said on MLB Network the day before that he would love to hit a home run, you know, in this moment. And the, the soccer style football celebration of him sliding on his knees at the front of the dugout to the fans, it was a massive moment. For Harper, because I think, you know, if you thought the guy was a superstar before, I think he just elevated his profile a little bit. What an amazing Phillies win on Saturday. The complete opposite happened on Sunday. But, you know, on Saturday, it was so many good vibes. It was so many. This is the best team in baseball essence to it because of, I mean, with Merrifield yanking that home run, Castellanos hitting that home run, Saturday was Everything that you knew the Phillies could be. But Sunday was symbolic of how baseball is a very, very long season. And I cannot say this enough to everybody out there, Nick. I am not taking anything away from Sunday's game except for guys have a bad day at the office. 
That was apparently, according to, I believe it was MLB Network, the worst day for the Phillies bullpen since May 1st. So it's been over a month since the Phillies bullpen has had a bad day at the office. Alvarado, arguably his worst outing of the season. GT Romuto, I mean, that ball that got by him almost never gets by anybody, right? You know, especially a guy who's one of the best catchers in baseball. So to me, I look at Sunday as just a bad day at the office. Things happen, and the Mets found a way to take advantage of your mistakes. It's not like the Phillies got shut down offensively. It's not like the Phillies didn't score any runs in the game. They just didn't score enough runs to prevent a collapse by you know, the bullpen not doing their job. And again, the bullpen has done their job most of the year. And nothing I saw this weekend, honestly, changes my mind from what I said on Thursday and Friday, which is if you're going into the deadline, at the trade deadline, Nick, you're going to go get a a bullpen pitcher and a right-handed bat who can play the outfield. Nothing has changed. There's nothing that happened this weekend that changes my mind because for as great as the win on Saturday was, and we were all feeling ourselves after that game, we were in the same mode in the opposite direction after Sunday, which is we know this is still a flawed baseball team. We know this is still a team that is not going to win every game the rest of the year. And let's be honest, if you thought the Phillies were going to leave Citizens Bank Park go to London, sweep the Mets, and then take suddenly two out of three against Boston and Baltimore coming up. I think you were out of your mind, Nick. Uh, I Listen, I would have liked to seen them sweep the Mets out there in, in London. It would have been nice, but because it was unfortunate. Taiwan Walker was fantastic on Sunday. Like, I know all the great vibes on Saturday were awesome. Harper hits home run. He does a celebration, which was awesome, by the way. And the reaction from Rob Thompson <laughs> was hysterical, too. That was funny when you he's just kind of looking at Harper in the dugout, just praying in his mind, like, hey, please don't get hurt. Don't hurt your knees. Um, so that was pretty funny uh, on Saturday. But Sunday... In the loss, Taiwan Walker, who's gotten a lot of heat as the fifth starter this year, coming back off of injury, he was fantastic. With five and two-thirds, had six strikeouts, gets pulled in the sixth inning for Gregory Soto, and that's kind of when the wheels fell off, right? Like, I understand going to to Soto there. I probably personally would have liked Strom in that situation, but um, I, I, I'm with you. It was just a bad day at the office from the bullpen. They've really, been f- fantastic all year. Really quick, on the Strom versus Soto point, there's two things to keep in mind. Mm-hmm. Number one, Strom and Alvarado have both pitched about half the Phillies games this year. Right. So at some point, you got to go to somebody else, right? You can't, you can't keep going to the same two guys every single night. I mean, go back to, remember when the Royals won the World Series? Was it 2015? Yeah. They had like four or five guys coming out of that bullpen. And it was like, that was a huge reason why they won the World Series. You go back to the Yankees of the late nineties. They had like five guys before they ever got to Mariano. So it was like the, the best teams have depth, and you traded for Gregory Soto for a reason. And guess what? In Soto's first 88 games with the Phillies, 68 of them, he gave up no runs. The other 20, he wasn't so good. So the majority of the time, okay, whatever the percentage is, 68 out of 88, it's what, like 70% basically. Yeah, do the math. You know, 70 <laughs> percent right, I'm doing it off the top of my head. I'm probably wrong with that number. I'm sure somebody will text in at 609-403-0973, let me know my math is wrong. But the point is, is that 68 out of 88 is not a bad ratio. But it's a bad ratio when you go up. And you'll lose a game like that, and it just impounds situation, which is why, whether you want to call it Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, whether you want to call it the Gregory Soto experience, I mean, Nick, you watch as much baseball as anybody, you know, you know that part of baseball is if you're not an elite pitcher, like, I don't know, is there even an elite pitcher on the Phillies? I mean, they have really good pitchers, but like, the bullpen is not elite, so you're going to expect those guys to maybe have a bad day here and there. Yeah, and and that kind of goes to the point of the trade deadline, right? We we talked about it on Friday, Ryan and I, and, and you jumped into the conversation as well. Like, for this Phillies team heading into the trade deadline, it would be nice if Rob Thompson had another option out of the bullpen, right? Like, that's why I think that's the priority over the bat in the outfield. I think you need to go after a bullpen piece, whether it's a Mason Miller. You have prospects to give up at this point. Do I love giving up? No, because I'm a big prospect guy. But 
If you go out and get another arm for Rob Thompson to put into this bullpen, have another option other than a Gregory Soto, even a lefty. If you go after another lefty or something, you go out and get someone like that so you're not put in this position with Soto. Because Soto struggled on the road this year as well. Remember, they're in London. I understand they were the home team for one game, but... It's a road game. Yeah, Yeah. it's a road game. So he struggled on the road. Um, And remember, Strom coming into that game had 25 straight appearances of not allowing a run. Like, that's how good Strom has been this year. But you got to give him some rest at some point. So I think they they have to go get another arm because you can never have too much pitching heading into the postseason. Sure. I think that's the number one priority at the deadline. I I, I know the outfield struggle. What are they, 25th, 26th um, overall as an offense in the outfield? Combined, right? I just, I, I think pitching is going to be more important down the stretch in those high leverage situations than an outfield bat. That's why you have to go go out and get another arm. And yesterday, yes, it was kind of an anomaly. They struggled a little bit. They've been fantastic all year. They're in London. That that's okay. But you have to go out and get another arm in my estimation because you got you don't want to go out there and have a Soto appearance all of the time, right? No, you don't. And I, I would also say that you know, to the pitching point, you know, I'm not saying you need to get the best pitcher on the market either. No. I just need you to get more depth because, again, as I said, if Alvarado and Strom have each pitched in almost half the team's games, you can't keep asking those guys to keep doing that. And no. at some point, you don't want to make the third and fourth guys Soto and Dominguez. I know Kirk Gering has been getting better. I know he has been – he he finally looks like he's – healthy again. You know what I mean? He yeah. finally looks like, you know, it, it took him some time to kind of like refine himself, but I think he's finally gotten there. The issue though is that, as you said, once you get past Alvarado, Strom, Hoffman, Kirkering, it's a little questionable, right? Mm-hmm. So, and I, I see somebody texting in at 609-403-0973, a uh, text they should have put Turnbull in. Here's the problem with Turnbull. I think Turnbull has proven that while he's a he's a solid pitcher, Nick, he's a much better starter right. because you you look at what Turnbull's numbers have been um, since his last start, right? Since the last time he started a game, those seven games, he has a two. Uh, what where is it? I just lost it. it he but he, it is, he has a five two five ERA in those seven games. In those seven games, he has allowed 14 hits, seven earned runs. Now, he does have 13 strikeouts and 12 innings out of the bullpen. So he's still going out there and pumping gas. But he has not been the pitcher he was as a starter. I don't know if that's a psychological thing. I don't know if we're, you know, looking at him and he's in the wrong roles, Nick, but... I don't know if Turnbull is the answer either. Well, also, you have to look at the matchup yesterday. You, you had to put in a lefty, right? Like, you're not going to put Turnbull in, uh, in that spot yesterday in, in the sixth inning, um, to, to relieve Walker. Um, yeah, I, Turnbull, it's, it's, it's a thing with pitchers, right? And we know baseball players are creatures of habit mm-hmm. and it's, it's a, it's a mental game. So, you know, moving from the bullpen, something he hasn't done a ton, right, uh, as a long reliever. It, it's a different mindset coming in in the fifth, sixth, seventh inning than going in and starting a game in the first, right? So yesterday, Turnbull, not, not the guy to put in yesterday due to the matchup. That, that's the reason he's not, he wasn't in yesterday. It was, it was a lefty righty thing. Um, so that's why you either go Strom or Soto in that spot right there. So, but with Turnbull, you know, he's a better starter than he is reliever, but he's been, he's been good coming out of the bullpen. And listen, you gotta give Walker a chance here, Josh, because he pitched really well yesterday. Five and two thirds. That was probably his best start of the year. The Phillies just fell apart. The bullpen just had a bad day. Um, and then obviously in the ninth inning, couldn't get it done with the Cassiano swinging bunt double play, which was, <laughs> it, it stuck. I mean, that was, of course, that was, um, By the way, where they, so Castellanos. Somewhere. They were not kidding when they said before before the Saturday game of how bouncy yeah. that ground is. I mean, I don't think I've, I have seen a, I have not, I don't remember an arena bouncing that much <laughs> since probably the Rogers Center in the early 90s with the Blue Jays yeah. before they replaced the turf with what it is now. I think it's like some different variation of turf right. now, but the Astro turf that they had in the old Astrodome, remember that? Well, maybe I'm too young for that, Nick, but the old Astrodome and then the Rogers Center in the 90s. Like, yeah. that's the last time I remember seeing balls bounce like that because yeah. some of those bounces were like, you know, 
I, I was wondering how those guys are going to like readjust their fielding because some of those went so high. It was just totally unexpected. Yeah, and we talk about Rojas, right? There was one play yesterday in, in Sunday's game where he just totally had a ball bounce right over his head and as he was coming in on it and just didn't expect it. Um, like that, that was crazy because it was all turf. All the grass was turf out there and it, it was like a tennis ball, Josh. It was like a tennis ball bouncing over your head. Um, so, and, and also another thing with that stadium is the white kind of overhang uh, of, of the the stadium, you kind of lost the ball. We saw Alec Bohm have trouble on, on a pop fly and foul territory. Right. It was happening to the Mets, too. Like, you kind of lost the ball, especially with the gray skies, too. So, it was an interesting dynamic with the field, bouncing all over the place, looking up. It's it's You're losing the ball into the sky and, and into the overhang as well. So, there, there were some issues, I guess, with the field of play, too, defensively for both sides. He's Nick Earnshaw. I'm Josh Henning, filling in for Mike Gill here on the Sports Bash on 973 ESPN FM, the 973 ESPN mobile app powered by First Bank of Seattle City. So to come, Mike Begay from the Press of Lang City coming up at 2.30. Bob Wankel from Crossing Broad at 3 p.m. to talk more about the Phillies. Football at 4 with Jeff Mosh from the Inside the Birds podcast. Lots of takeaways to get into about the Eagles a little bit later in the show. Back to the text at 609-403. 0970. Jeff from Ocean City chimes in. Says the loss yesterday was disappointing, but there is no stopping this Phillies team to me. I want to know when will Schwarber hit his next home run? That's an interesting question. Yeah. Because Schwarber the last couple of years has been absolutely on fire in the month of June. Well, since his last home run, Schwarber, on May 29th, so that's eight games since then. Yeah. While the Phillies are six and two, Schwarber has a 161 batting average with no homers, one RBI, and nine strikeouts. So, uh, talk, talk about a guy getting cold at the absolutely wrong time. Yeah, and Schwarber, he reached base, uh, three times yesterday. He did, he did start to get it, get it going a little bit in yesterday's game. But yeah, it's been a while, right? Like every year, it's like, all right, June Schwarber time. He's going to start going off. This is when his season really begins. Um, we really haven't seen that so far this month. He's really struggled. Um, but you know, he gets on base a couple of times yesterday. It's, it's kind of like the Castellanos thing, right? You got to let him just continue to get at bats, right? And, you know, heading back to the States, Hopefully in Boston, it's a little bit of a shorter, um, you know, field and in, in right field, right? Shorter, um, I guess down the line. So maybe he gets it going this one because he's had some really hard hit balls. He had, had a couple of times in the London series where he, he had a couple of foul balls, um, that went really deep. So I, I think he'll get it going. Just be a little patient. Um, I, I think it's just, it's similar to Castellanos. Give him the at bats. He'll get there eventually. It's just, we're so accustomed to him in June. Being that guy hitting all these home runs and getting really hot, it just hasn't happened yet. What are we, 10 days into June? He's got to start getting to going if he wants to keep up the June Schwarber nickname, Josh. I think the biggest problem for Schwarber right now is, you know that base hit that he got on Saturday? Yes. It was like a line drive. Right. He He's not, he, it's almost like he's not seeing the belt ball well enough to really leverage his swing right now. And I don't know if that's a mechanical thing. I'm not sure if it's a mental thing. I never play major league baseball, so I can't, <laughs> I can't tell you which it is, but it's just the my eyeballs, Nick. He, he looks like a guy that is just not seeing the ball well enough right now. And you know what? You're right. It may take him some time. It may take him a week or so to really figure. And by the way, you know, this whole, Travel to London, travel to Boston, travel yeah. to Baltimore. This is not going to be an easy stretch for these guys. And someone somewhere is going to struggle. Right now, it just happens to be Schwarber. And it's more amplified because it's the month of June. Well, I'll even add this, though. He's hit in three straight games going back to the Milwaukee series. So he's had a hit uh, since uh, last Wednesday, the 5th. And then he hit in both games in the Mets series in London. But so, a hit is not what Jeff from Ocean City is saying. He wants homers. I know. He wants I'm with him. I'm with him. I totally agree. He's been getting base hits and that's not what we are expecting out of Kyle Schwarber, right? Like I get it. He's the leadoff hitter. It's good that he's getting base hits. He's getting on base. That that's that's priority number one. But you want to see Schwarber like you need a leadoff home run to just get the juices going a little bit, right? Like we need that back if if you're watching the Phillies. So I, I think for Schwarber 
Schwarber. It's about just getting more at bats. Um, just keep trotting them out there. I mean, it's a long season, right? Like the baseball season's so long. You start end of March and you go through September into October. You're going to have ebbs and flows of the season. We're just, like I said, so accustomed to Schwarber really getting it going in June and being that power guy at the top of the lineup, hitting 50-plus home runs, 40-plus home runs every single year. So I think it'll it'll happen. It just, just be patient. It's okay. We don't have to panic yet. We're nitpicking here, okay, Jeff? We're nitpicking a little bit. It's, oh, you know, that's where we're at. When you have the best team in baseball, you got to find something, right? And I think Schwarber will get it rolling. Maybe Boston's the perfect place for it, especially, especially since the dimensions are a little bit shorter in the outfield, and you have the green monster as well. I also just realized I probably asked the wrong person that question because Nick Earnshaw is probably the most easygoing Philadelphia sports fan I've ever met <laughs> in my life. So, like, Nick Nick is, like, the epitome of positivity over yes. here. So, like, you know, the you know, it could be a cloudy, rainy day, and Nick has still got a smile on his face. So it's like, you know, I think the only thing we can Nick down is if somebody he cared about died. <laughs> I think that's the only thing that would make you miserable. Listen, well, these teams have made me miserable plenty of times over the years, okay? I've attended two straight uh, game, Sixers games in the playoffs, Game 6 last year, Game 7 this year, also Game 7 for the Phillies uh, this past year. I've, I've been miserable. I can be miserable if I want, but I'm not going to be miserable in June when you have the best record <laughs> in baseball, Josh. I can't be miserable then. Well, no, that, all that means is that you just should never go to a Phillies a Sixers no, playoff I, game. I, I've learned that. I've learned that. And no the, playoff games for Nick Earnshaw. <laughs> no, because it's not. It's not been pretty since Game Five of the of the NLCS a couple of years ago when Harper hit the home run. Now, that's the, that's the last like good playoff game I've been to, Josh. So I can't go to playoff games anymore. But in June, I'll go to a game in June and I'm going to be positive. When you're the best team in baseball, you're, the team's hitting, the team's pitching well. It's okay. We can we can relax a little bit. We don't have to nitpick as much. I, they'll be fine. Well, we're still going to nitpick. I mean, we are. It's, it's our nature. It's our nature to nitpick in sports radio. Come on. <laughs> He's Nick Earnshaw. I'm Josh Hiddick filling for Mike Gill here on the Sports Bash with 973 ESPN. We'll get more your text a little bit later in the hour. Keep them coming in. 609-403-0973 in your DMs into the 973 ESPN mobile app powered by First Bank of Seattle. See our Phillies conversation being brought to you by Clark's Moving and Storage located in Rio Grande. Moving is a breeze with Clark's Moving and storage. We'll also get to the Eagles a little bit later in the hour. Plus, this, this Dan Hurley story is absolutely wow. We will touch on that. And by the way, how about this for a little NFL news dump on a random Monday afternoon? Mike Tomlin with a three-year contract extension. How about that? How about that? In Pittsburgh, remember last year they thought, oh, maybe they let him go. They let go the offensive coordinator, Matt Canada. So they, they thought there was a little bit of trouble in paradise of Pittsburgh. Apparently not. My, Mike Tomlin's one of the best coaches in football, no doubt about it. Very well deserved. You know, gets a new quarterback, Russell Wilson. They want to see how this plays out. Yeah, it, it's absolutely fascinating when you see stuff like this because, you know, a guy like Tomlin, everyone loves and respects that guy. And the idea that he could have maybe been let go. I know. And, it, and it's, it's, it's the weird ebb and flow of sports. You talk about how we in sports talk radio, television, podcasts, everybody, everybody loves the nitpick, but we lose perspective on the big picture. And the big picture is what is the goal? The goal is to win football games, right? So what coach is going to be better than Mike Tomlin to help the Steelers win games? I don't know if that guy exists, Nick, because guess what? Whether it's Belichick, whether it is Pete Carroll, whether it's any of these older coaches, I don't know what their future is. I don't know if they're going to go in Pittsburgh to do a better job than Tomlin is. No, I, I don't think so. I, I think it's you got to keep Tomlin in in Pittsburgh, especially when you get a new quarterback in, right? He's had Kenny Pickett uh, the past couple of years. He had a young quarterback right now, obviously back up for Jalen Hurts in Philadelphia, but. I, you got to see what he's got with the with the veteran quarterback, and you know he's had a history there. He's been a fantastic coach. You can't you can't just move on from a guy like Mike Tomlin on, on a whim, and, and especially if you're struggling a little bit during the season. I I think it's very well deserved. All right, we'll get more into all that a little bit later in the show. But coming up next, Mike McGarry of the Press of Lakes. We'll get his thoughts on the Phillies Mets weekend in London. All that and more still to come here on 97.3 ESPN. Josh Hittig, Nick Earnshaw, filling in for Mike Gill on a Monday edition of the Sports Bash. It's actual speeds vary. It's Mike Gill. And I am the voice of the voiceless. On 97.3 ESPN and the 97.3 ESPN free mobile app. 
Josh Hennick filling in for Mike Gill alongside Nick Earnshaw here in the 973 ESPN studios. Of course, Ocean Casino Resort, the proud sponsors of our studios here, 973 ESPN FM. Mike McGarry for the Press of Atlantic City. He is back from a busy sports weekend. Phillies in London, ShopRite LPGA. We'll get into all that and more right now with Mike McGarry for the Press of Atlantic City here on the Sports Bash on 97.3 ESPN. Mike, welcome back in. How you doing today? Hey, Josh. Doing well. How about yourself? Doing pretty good. I know you uh, kept busy at the ShopRite LPGA. Tell us what your takeaways were from the event and how the weekend went for you. Well, just a just a great event, an event that's kind of always been, you know, signals the start of summer to me, basically. And uh, yesterday, you know, you didn't have a field filled with a lot of well-known LPGA golfers, but what you did get was some history. Lene Strom goes out in the morning, shoots a 60 on the Bay Course. Uh, you know, she becomes the sixth uh, LPGA player to shoot 60. Only one player, Annika Sorenstam, has shot a 59. And then she completes the biggest comeback in LPGA history since the LPGA began keeping records of such things in, in 1984 as she goes from tied for 52nd to winning the tournament. So, you know, you go to a sporting event, they always say expect the unexpected. Well, I don't think anybody expected that. At the beginning of the day, she had point zero zero one one percent chance of winning, according to the analytics. But at the end of the day, you know, she was holding the trophy. So a great tournament out there at uh, Seaview with the ShopRite LPJ Classic this year. You know, it's interesting, Mike, because before we get to the Phillies, you know, one of the interesting conversations that has been having big picture, and we could bring it to the ShopRite LPGA and for you, Mike, you know, you've covered sports at all levels, high school, college, pro. There, there has been a greater emphasis and attention to women's sports in the last several months in the aftermath of the Caitlin Clark phenomenon for you, you know, how have you perceived some of that attention? Do you think that, you know, it it has benefited women's sports in general or not? Like what is your take on that? Because like I said, you've covered men's and women's sports at different levels. Yeah. You know, I think if you get a compelling personality with, which uh, Caitlin Clark is, uh, you know, it's kind of a rising tide raises all boats, right? And and maybe opens up people's minds to looking at events that they normally wouldn't look at. Uh, you know, the LPGA has has a tremendous history. Uh, the ShopRite LPGA Classic has a tremendous history. Some of its past champions, Annika Sorenstam, Nancy Lopez, uh, Julie Inkster, Betsy King have been, you know, uh, Brooke Henderson, Lexi Thompson have been the best women's golfers in the world. Uh, and, and so I just think it's a, it's a great event to me, kind of, uh, maybe some people are just catching up to what a lot of us who have followed women's sports and covered events like the shop, right? LBJ classic for 20 plus years ha- have already known just how great and entertaining, uh, those events are. Let's get to the Phillies, Mike, obviously splitting the weekend with the Mets. You had the high of Saturday's game. What a win. What a moment. What an emotional roller coaster of a high for Phillies fans. And then the bullpen, basically the worst game they've had since May 1st. The bullpen literally choked away a game. Uh, is it as simple as it's a 162 game season, Mike? Yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, the Mets had actually been playing well when they went to Europe. They had swept uh, the Nationals three games before they went over there. So, you know, the getting a split with the Mets, not the worst thing in the world. I thought Alvarado, I watched that inning yesterday, he kind of struggled with his command a little bit, but he was also unlucky. You know, the ball up the middle that, you know, if that ball is two feet to the right, it's right at uh, Stott, and he's able to make the play. Otherwise, he do- he dives, he just misses it. The infield hit the boom, you know, kind of a cheap hit, and then the inning kind of unravels from there. Uh, I'm not going to push the panic button. They're 45-20. and 20. They lead the division by nine games. Could they get better? Yeah, and I think we all know what that is. It's, it's another bullpen arm that can close games, and it's, and it's a right-handed bat, you know, to come off the bench and, or maybe play in the outfield. Those are the two things they need by the trade deadline, but I'm not going to push any panic button here uh, over a split series in, in in London in June. Hey, Mike, it's Nick here. Uh, Taiwan Walker probably had one of his best outings of the season yesterday. Just what were some of your takeaways from his start and you know what, what he was able to do through five and two-thirds yesterday? 
Yeah, I mean, he threw well, got a lot of strikeouts. It clearly was his best start of the season. Like, a lot of people, Tyron Walker is a constant source of conversation around here. But but here's the deal. Every game I've ever been to, somebody pitches. And the Phillies need five starting pitchers to go through a rotation. And they're paying Tyron Walker. He's in the second year of a four-year, $72 million contract. Last year, he won 15 games. He is a pitcher who I believe the last three years he's thrown more than 170 innings. Uh, he is going to get every chance. He is going to get a long rope. People that think, oh, he struggled. He's sort of pitching for a spot in the rotation on an outing by outing performance just aren't being realistic at the things. Taiwan Walker might not pitch in the postseason. He might not be on the postseason roster, but between now and the start of the postseason, unless he's injured, he's going out there every fifth day because even when he tends to struggle, he still eats up five or six innings, and you need those guys over the course of 162 innings. So Taiwan Walker is going to be in the rotation going forward, and, and, and to discuss you know, what, you know, should he be pulled? He pitched well yesterday or not. You know, he's the guy. They're paying him $72 million. He's going to be out there pitching. Mike, when you think about the pitching, I had said before you came on, I am still convinced that the Phillies, when they get to the deadline, they still need a bullpen pitcher. They still need a right-handed bat. Did you come out of the weekend thinking any differently? No, I think absolutely. I mean, I think yesterday – you know, if they had a right-handed guy with closing experience, I think that would be uh, a key guy to sort of pick up. And, yeah, they could use another bat, uh, although Whit Merrifield did show signs of waking up. Yo, know, Dahl had another home run yesterday. Castellanos is hitting the ball a bit better. So, again, you've got to the trade deadline. You've got to the end of July to sort of figure this out and where – where they're going to be. But I think those are the two areas where you would say, hey, if this team had to improve itself and there was a guy available that fit that role, yeah, I would go get him. Only because I think the Phillies' window for a championship is really open this year and and next year. Then they're going to get into some issues. I know guys come off the books, but the younger guys are going to have to get paid. I mean, how much money is Ranger Suarez earning himself so far this season? So, uh, you know, I think this year and next year are the Phillies' prime opportunities to sort of win a World Series. So to me, you've got to make the roster as strong as you can going to, into October. And yes, I would agree. You know, a, a bullpen guy that can maybe has experience as a closer and a right-handed bat are the two things that the Phillies need to sort of make that roster as strong as possible. Mike, what is your perspective on the idea? Mike McGay of the Press of Atlantic City joining us here on the Sports Bash. Josh Henning and Nick Earnshaw filling in for Mike Gill on 97.3 ESPN at AC Press McGarry on Twitter. From you, I had said, you know, multiple times that I don't want to give up the wrong prospect because we've already seen around baseball. I know there's not a, an easy formula for this. I know sometimes you can't always predict this stuff. You know, almost everyone you traded for Cliff Lee years ago was a nothing burger at the major league level. But in recent years, you've traded guys like Nick Pavetta and Ben Brown. They've gone on to have solid, good seasons with other teams. Is there any concern that you don't want to trade the wrong guy from the system right now? No, not to me. Again, because I feel that window is open this year and next year, I am going to trade anybody necessary to make this major league roster as strong as it possibly can be. So I'm not worried about giving up prospects. Uh, I'm not worried about, you know, a a guy like Logan O'Hoppy. Maybe, you know, you trade him and, and five years from now, you know, he's a star and, and, and you you as a team are struggling because hopefully you'll have one World Series or two to look back on it and say that trophy, uh, that trade was worthwhile. So at, at this point with the Phillies, I'm not hesitant. I, I am training whoever it is necessary at, in the organization, prospect, young player, to make this team as strong as he could possibly be to take a legitimate swing at the World Series this year and next. Hey, Mike. So I, I got to talk about Kyle Schwarber a little bit here. He, he's been struggling as of late, but he's hitting his last three games. But the homers and the power have not been there. Do you think it's just a case of kind of what Castellanos went through? He just needs to continue to get more at-bats, and maybe it'll come through, and it's just a long season at that point? 
Yeah, absolutely. I think we're, we're all kind of a little spoiled, right? We're all wondering what's going on because today's, what, June 10th and June is yeah. his month and he hasn't <laughs> had that typical June. So we're like, where is it? You know, where is it, Kyle? Where is your June coming? You know it's coming. You know that two to three week period is coming where he hits a home run just about every time up and he gets unbelievably hot. I mean, one of the things about the Phillies and, and is there – Achilles heel a little bit is they have a lot of streaky guys, right? Castellanos is streaky. Schwab is streaky. In reality, all baseball players are, are streaky. Nobody, you know, goes, you know, uh, you know, one for three every day. They all blow hot and cold, but the Phillies have guys who are especially streaky. Schwaber is one of them. I'm not worried about him as long as he's healthy, which I believe he is. Those home runs, that streak that we've seen the last two years is going to come. We're just kind of sitting on the edge of our seat, right? Because today's June 10th, and usually it starts June 1st. But but it's coming at some point. And, uh, yeah, I, I have all the faith in the world in Kyle Schwaber and, and what he can do for the Phillies as the season progresses. That hot streak is coming. It's just a matter of uh, of when. Mike, before we let you go, I want to know what of the three big basketball stories from the weekend had more of your interest? Was it the Celtics going up 2-0? Was it Caitlin Clark being left off the women's national team for the Olympics? Or was it Dan Hurley now saying no to the Lakers? I'm fascinated by Danny Hurley saying no to the Lakers. I mean, that is tough to say no to. I mean, you look at the Los Angeles Lakers. They are maybe the premier franchise in the NBA, right? And if you just look at sports franchises around the world, right, the Lakers are in your your top ten. They're up there with, uh, you know, Manchester United and, I don't know, Real Madrid soccer or whatever, a soccer team in Italy, whatever their big soccer team is, the Yankees in baseball, the Dallas Cowboys in football, it's the Lakers in basketball. And when somebody throws a lot of money at you to coach one of the best franchises in the world – it's tough to say no. So I'm fascinated that Danny said no and decided to stay at the University of Connecticut. Because to me, Josh, there was no downside. If he goes and coaches the NBA, I think Danny is a, is a smart enough coach and you know has the emotional intelligence to adjust his style to deal with NBA players. So I thought he would have been successful. But even if he wasn't successful, okay, he returns to college in two years and has his pick up any college job in the country, basically, because of the success at Connecticut. So I'm fascinated that Danny decided to stay at Connecticut and uh, and turn down the Lakers job. He might be the first guy in the history of America to choose to stay in stores, Connecticut, and not move to sunny Los Angeles. <laughs> well, we should remember we are 20 years almost to the day when Coach K said no to the Lakers. Right, so it has right. been done before. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting, right? And, you know, Krzyzewski then, of course, went on to coach the U.S. Olympic team and sort of get his pro sort of experience that way. But, yeah, I'm fascinated that Danny decided to stay at, at Connecticut. It's, it's great for college basketball. Uh, you know, it's, it's great for the University of Connecticut. But, boy, staying no to that money and saying no to the Los Angeles Lakers is, not, let's put it this way, not many guys, not many coaches would have made the decision that Danny did. And I guess that's kind of what makes him special. He's Mike Begay for the Press of Atlantic City. Give him a follow on the Twitter X platform at AC Press Begay. Check out all of his coverage of South Jersey High School sports, the Phillies, and more at the press of com. Mike, you'll be back on Wednesday, and Mike Gill will be back that day as well. Oh, there you go. Back from my, I saw he was over in England, so I hope the time change doesn't get him when he comes back. I'm sure we'll find out pretty quickly otherwise. So. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Mike, take care. All right, guys, great talking to you. See you later. Bye-bye. Always great to talk to Mike Begay of the Press of Lang City here on the Sports Bash. Josh Henning along with Nick Earnshaw in the studio filling in for Mike Gill on 97.3 ESPN. We'll get back to text on the other side at 609-403-0973. Your DMs into the 97.3 ESPN mobile app powered by First Bank of Seattle. So to come, Bob Wankel from Crossing Broad at RedOctoberPhilly.com who joins us at the 3 o'clock hour by Nick on the other side. I'm going to tell you the real reason why Dan Hurley said no to the Lakers. And it's not the reason people think or even are talking about. And I think it should be the biggest thing we're talking about. But certain blowhards in the national media are ignoring a fact. Sometimes I know facts get away a good story. 
But we're going to get to the facts coming up next. Show the Sports Bash. Josh Hedding, Nick Earnshaw, live in the Ocean Casino Resort Studios on 97.3 ESPN FM. And don't forget the 97.3 ESPN mobile app. It's free. Thanks to First Bank of Seattle City. Man, that sunset is gorgeous. Grill, patio, sunset. Hard to get better than that. Unless you're browsing Carvana's inventory while you soak it all in. Oh, burger time. So sit back, get comfortable. Carvana's got thousands of cars under $20,000 just waiting for you. I could stay here forever. Carvana, where car buying meets comfort meets convenience. Download the app or visit Carvana.com today. The Sports Bash with Mike Gill on 97.3 ESPN and the free mobile app. Josh Eddick back filling in for Mike Gill here on the Sports Bash on 97.3 ESPN FM. Hello with Nick Earnshaw live in the Ocean Casino Resort Studios. By the way, a little update. Bob Wankel will not be joining us at 3 o'clock. He's got some things to take care of. He'll be joining us at 5 o'clock tonight here on 97.3 ESPN. So, yes, it's doing a little bit longer to get to Bob today. Just hang we in got, there. We got hang plenty there, to get to. Nick, I promise I get to everybody the real reason. Yeah, you did. About I, I was intrigued. Danny I Hurley. don't even know. So, for those who didn't see, Danny Hurley today turned down a six-year, $70 million contract from the LA Lakers. Now, for those who didn't hear the, the full narrative of events of this, because I know this has been a hot topic over the weekend, but you know, maybe people were too busy at the beach or watching the Phillies game, and they saw the news today, like, wait, what the heck is going on? Why did he turn down this money? Well, here's the full story. So, apparently... Bobby, I'm uh, sorry, Dan Hurley, Bobby's his father, by the way, uh, Bob Hurley, the famous <laughs> yeah. coach from uh, North Jersey, Dan Hurley said, didn't really want the job in the first place, apparently. Apparently, he was very, you know, set into coaching UConn, but the Lakers apparently pushed him, pushed the it so much that he obliged them on a meeting. And today he announced around like 1.45 p.m. the news came out that he said no. Well, you know what happened at 2 o'clock today, Nick? What's that? The UConn Twitter X account said practice begins right now. <laughs> That's perfect. That's which, perfect. Which we know that was planned. That was not an yes. accident that happened. So here's the real reason why Dan Hurley said no to this job. It's because of his wife. For those who don't know, Dan Hurley's wife pretty much is the catalyst for everything in his life. She'll lay out his clothes for him at times. She'll have his food orders set up so he remembers to eat during the day. She'll make sure the players are taken care of with certain things that they need for their personal life. Dan Hurley apparently is so basketball 24-7 centric that his wife is like the real world counterbalance for him. And his wife was the reason why he didn't go to Kentucky. He said no to the Kentucky job because his wife said, why do we want to go there? We're happy here. We can win more national championships here. Why should we leave UConn for another job? And a lot of people have talked about this. Seth Greenberg is on ESPN television, the former college basketball coach. Jeff Goodman of Stadium has talked about this. If Dan Hurley's wife would have said yes to the Lakers job, that would have been done days ago. So the fact it took this long was a clear sign to me he was never going to L.A. It was essentially a tell that he wasn't going to go to L.A. like that. He was going to come out and announce it. Like, if it would have been right away, essentially. Right. And obviously, it's a it's an easy way to leverage, hey, UConn, you should give me more money. You hey, know, like, yeah, like, you give me more years. I could know? go to the Lakers. I could go across, across the country. And go don't to forget, the Lakers job. We are almost exactly 20 years to the day, Nick. That Coach K also said no to the Lakers. How about that? Like, isn't that crazy? It's almost to the exact pinpoint day of Coach K doing it. The same thing. Turns Coach K is Mike McGarry went on to uh, coach USA basketball, win more national championships. Is it the same in Dan Hurley's future? I uh, it very well could be with how good UConn's been over the past few years. Definitely could happen. He's Nick Earnshaw. I'm Josh Kennick. Filling for Mike Gill here on 973 ESPN. Coming up the other side, we'll get into more Phillies talk as well as Eagles conversation here on the Sports Bash, the Monday edition on 97.3 ESPN.
Jersey. This is the Sports Bash with Mike Gill on 97.3 ESPN and the 97.3 ESPN free mobile app. Now live from inside the Ocean Casino Resort Studio, here's Mike Gill. Josh Eddie Philly for Mike Gill here on 97.3 ESPN FM, 97.3 ESPN mobile app powered by First Bank of Sea Isle City. Got to be honest, Nick, not fully sure what happened right there. I uh, <laughs> <All good. laughs> hit the play button on the music and nothing happened. It's technology, you know. It happens. It happens everywhere. Sometimes, you know, it just won't cooperate with us, Josh, and that's all the time. It's okay. We, but we're, we're here. We got through. We're on the air. We're fine. We're good. See, now, now I'm curious for why this thing was And you, I, you literally heard me playing this. I, yeah, I did. I heard it playing. I don't know what happened, but, like, <laughs> it's, it's the computer system here sometimes. It's crazy. It's crazy. But... No, Josh, like, it's funny, because now during the commercial break, you're going to try and figure out what happened. You're going to go through every single outlet. There it is. Here's the music. It's back. You're going to go through every single outlet you can to try and figure out why did that happen. <laughs> we right, got well, it back. Well, well, we'll do it better next time. Apparently, actually, it was my fault. I, I had it on the wrong button. Uh, it's you okay. Were, well, you were recording the update during the break for the, it's to pull back the curtain. You were recording the update. I didn't put the button back on for the music for our ears, but the audience heard the music. So it's a bad job by me. Behind, I, behind, the, uh, behind the scenes. Dropping of the ball by Josh Hedding here on 97.3. Because you know, if Mick Yell was here, it'd be perfect, right? <laughs> it definitely would have been. It definitely would have been yeah. behind the board right there. Pushing the buttons. Uh, but, We'll check about the text board in just a bit. 609-403-0973. Your DMs into the 973 ESPN mobile app powered by First Bank Seattle. Uh, Bob Wankel will join us a little bit later in the show. Uh, he was unable to come on at this time, but he'll be joining us coming up. It looks like tonight at 5 o'clock, so we'll talk with him then. But, you know, we want to get to some Eagles talk here because Bob didn't join us. And I see Diamondback Derek. He texted in. Dying back, Derek, we'll get to you a little bit later in the hour because he brought up an interesting question, Nick. But I wanted to get to some of the audio that you and I have procured right. before the show because I wrote the article on 973 ESPN.com and the 973 ESPN mobile app powered by First Bank to see how my four biggest takeaways from Eagles minicamp. I thought one of the biggest takeaways that needs to be talked about more is – we all know we have new coordinators here in Philadelphia, right? We all know that Kellen Moore, or Vic Fangio, they're in their first year in Philadelphia. And I've heard numerous people talk about here on 97.3 ESPN and other outlets how important it was for everybody to be in camp this week, right? And it was a good thing to see everybody in camp, right? The only really guy who wasn't there was Landon Dickerson, and he had an excused absence, right? But it was Jalen Hurts who said this. That stood out to me almost more than anything else from Eagles camp this week. Now, there's obviously stuff we saw on the field that stands out. But of what was said, Nick Earnshaw, this is the audio that stands out to me more than any other. There's been a lot of new inventory in. Um, majority of it, you know, probably 95% of it being new. And so... It's just been uh, been that process, and it's been a fun process because you get to see um, what works for other people. And the, the number of coaches that I've had um, since I've been here, I've been able to take in a lot of new knowledge and new understanding. And so I think the goal coming in was to learn Kellen's offense and master it. Um, and I think that's been a process, and I think by the end of it, I want it to be mine um, and, and have it in, in my own way. So there's two two big parts of what Hertz said. Let's start with the first part. 95% of the offense is new. That is a huge statement. Because what you're saying is, is, Nick, we already know what's going to happen. This team is not going to get off out of the gates 100%. There is going to be some growing pains as this entire organization is acclimating themselves to an offense Jill says he's going to make it his own, Nick. Right. But the reality is that no matter how much he wants to make it his own, it won't be his on day one. It's still going to be a work in progress. And I think that because of that, number one, we got to be patient. Patient because 
There is a learning curve. Kellen Moore comes from a completely different background than the Nick Sirianni, Shane Steich, and Brian Johnson triumvirate. And I know what some people are saying, that's the other, Nick. Oh, come on, Josh. Kellen Moore and Brian Johnson, they were both college quarterbacks, right? A completely different coaching philosophies, completely different experiences, completely different everything. Don't lump these all guys in the one boat. Kellen Moore comes from Boise State, where they ran a version of the Air Coryell offense. Then in the NFL, when he was a backup quarterback for the Lions and the Cowboys, West Coast offense, Mike Martz spread offenses. Kellen Moore does not come from the same tree. You know, Sirianni comes from that, you know, tight end formation, Todd Haley offense, uh, who else? Mike, Mike McCoy with the Chargers. Right. Frank Reich with the Colts, right? Brian Johnson, he played under Urban Meyer at Utah in that offensive system. And then he worked with a Urban Meyer disciple, Dan Mullins, at Mississippi State in Florida. And then Shane Steichen, he also comes from a less of a spread offensive concept. What does Kellen Moore do? A lot of motion before the play. Eagles were one among the least motion pre-snap in the NFL. So there are some clear differences. And I'm glad Jalen Hurts brought that up, Nick, because now you will not see the same offense as last year. No, you won't. And, you know, it stinks for Jalen Hurts because now he's on his third offensive coordinator in three years, right? He had Steichen a couple years ago, Brian Johnson last year, and now this year, Kellen Moore. Like, it feels like, and throughout his career, in his college career, you know, he changed from, he, he transferred from Alabama to Oklahoma, right? So, like, he has gone through a bunch of changing of offensive schemes throughout his career. So, it's not like, oh, yeah, he, he's used to it. He's changed it over time, right? He's always changing offenses. It's very difficult to change a majority of what you already knew over the past couple of years now to something completely different. You're going to see more motion, right? You're going to see more creativity out of a Kellen Moore offense. And with Jalen Hurts, for him, it's like, wow, 95% of the offense is going to be new. How does this adjust? How do you, and especially when you have no preseason, right? You're not going to really be playing much in the preseason over the past couple of years. That's been a thing, right? The starters aren't really going to play too much in the preseason. So it's going to be those first couple of weeks of the season where you're kind of installing and trying out everything new that you learned over in training camp, right? With this new install of the offense. So this is something to watch for the first couple of weeks of the year, right? Like this is a brand new scheme that kind of Jalen Hurts is going to have to get uh, familiar with as well as the rest of the guys on the offensive side because we know how dull the offense was last year, Josh. It was really dull, not much going on, not much pre-snap motion, etc. And you're going to see a little bit more of that this season. I wonder how Hurts adjusts. I think they'll be fine, but you're going to see the growing pains like you mentioned uh, just a couple minutes ago. You know, it's interesting because you mentioned about Hurts, all the offenses he's been through. You know, yeah. People forget, you know, he went from high school senior year <laughs> to last year. Sorry, I'm at 2022. Was the last time he went through that many years yeah. with a different offense coordinator every single year. 2021, 2022 was the first time in his football life the guy has had the same coordinator in his ear calling plays. So you're right. There is a party that kind of looks at Hurts and feels bad for him because mm-hmm. it's like, my goodness, this guy is learning another new offense. That may be part of the reason why he was so blah at the press conference more than usual <laughs> yeah. because maybe he's a little disinterested and maybe he's just like, you guys don't understand how tough, tough, tough this is, man. <laughs> There's only like, 5%. Only 5% staying from last year. <laughs> and what is a 5% anyway? Yeah. He like, just, I think he just made the number up, probably. Of course he did. But, you know, <laughs> yeah, no. And I don't think it's literally 95%. It but, might be more like 80%. I don't yeah. know. But the, the larger point is that Hurts, obviously, he wants to be proficient in his offense. And and he wants people to understand that it's 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 a process. It's It's a work in progress. And... You know, there are some interesting differences because remember, Kellen Moore, and I, don't take the Chargers year and read too much into it because Justin Herbert got injured that year and every other player on the team got injured that year. It was ridiculous. They were down to their third street yep. quarterback last year with the Chargers. But Kellen Moore likes to pressure the opposing defense. He likes to manipulate opponents and get them out of position. The Steichen Sirianni way is not to do that, Nick. The Steichen Sirianni way is to read and react to the defense. 
So it's two different philosophies. It's you go from walking up to the line and reacting to a defensive front to now saying we're going to manipulate the other team and we're going to pressure them in the breaking. Completely different approach, completely different attitude. And I think outside of just the numbers that we could throw at people here on 97.3, Josh Hennig and Nick Earnshaw filling in for Mike Gill on a Monday afternoon. For the Eagles, Nick, if you are a team that is trying to rectify what went wrong last year, this is one way to rectify it, basically saying we are going to hit the reset button. Yeah, we're essentially starting over, changing our entire philosophy to something new, something more fresh. Now, I'll even throw this out there to you, Josh, and the listeners out there. So if you want to text in 609-403-0973, I'll even throw this out there. Because Kellen Moore, he's gone through a couple changes over the past couple years, going from Dallas to the Chargers as well to the Eagles now. Now, what if they do have a good year? What if they do have a nice year next year? The offense is stellar. They go on a deep playoff run. Kellen Moore could be out of here after one year. Like, that's another thing that's crossed my mind, Josh. Like, after this year, if everything goes to plan, hopefully it does. I know everything's changing. We might see some struggles early on in the season because of the change in philosophy. But what if everything goes well, Josh? That's another question you have to think and have on the back burner of your brain because if everything goes well, Kellen Moore could get a job next year. He could leave again. So what does that do for your franchise quarterback continually making adjustments and learning new offenses every single year? And like you mentioned, he's done this since high school. He did this in college, and he hasn't had back to really back-to-back years a ton throughout his young career of learning that same offense. That That's something I think people should watch for like going forward. Like, okay, yes, right now it's, it's early. It's still June. We haven't even trading camp yet. But I'm just saying, like, what if they do have a big year offensively, everything kind of goes to plan, Hurts has this MVP-type year, and then Kellen Moore goes off and gets another job? I think that's something that people should keep in the back of their minds just in case because this is this could be a question every single offseason we're talking about with Jalen Hurts, right? Is he learning a new offense every single year? I mean, that's how the NFL goes, but that's something to keep in the back of your mind. And what's interesting is that for the, you know, people like to point out that Hurts didn't have a great year last year. But Pro Football Focus did a breakdown of the quarterback last year, and, and it shows that Jalen Hurts was one of the most efficient quarterbacks on immediate, intermediate throws last year. He was actually the only quarterback of the 35 qualifying quarterbacks for the Pro Football Focus to not have a turnover worthy play. Despite making 99 attempts that could have been turnovers, they weren't turnovers on intermediate passing. So what does that say? The majority of Hertz's turnovers last year were not on plays that he was reading immediately. They were on predetermined throws. And this gets back to the thing I was screaming about last year here on 97.3 ESPN. And I argued with everyone about on the 97.3 ESPN mobile app powered by First Bank of Seattle. There is a huge, huge difference between the throw that the quarterback is told to make and the quarterback decides to make. And there were a lot of those turnovers that were predetermined for Hurts to go to a certain play. Because where does Brian Johnson's coaching experience come from? college and what do they do to the college quarterback almost every college quarterback who is not named like Peyton Manning right or Andrew Luck option one option two run or get the ball out of your hands there is literally determined throws in every single formation this has been broken down by the people like Brian Baldinger and Dan Orlovsky and Emery Hunt and Greg Cosell people who know more football than we do okay so I'm not some savant over here I'm telling you what smart football people say if Jalen Hurts made a lot of turnovers because he was told he was not allowed to make adjustments or make changes to patterns, then why are we hating on this guy, Nick? Yeah, I mean, if this is what he was told to do last year, right? Go to the first read. 
this is already predetermined for you, then you can't blame it on Jalen Hurts. I mean, that's kind of that's why everyone was so frustrated with Brian Johnson last year because the offense was so stale. It was like, all right, go to your first read, uh, maybe second read, uh, and then take off if you need to. And that's why it was so easy for opposing defenses to figure out what the Eagles were doing. Like it was just easy for him. And you heard in different press conferences that opposing teams uh, were able to figure out what the Eagles were doing because it was so basic. It was college esque, high school as basic offense for for the Eagles last year and Brian Johnson what he installed it was easy to figure out from from just watching the game i mean you could see it as a fan how simple their offense was last year and you know i'm not going to put the whole, all all the blame on, on Brian Johnson obviously there were some execution issues as well but a majority of the blame should go to him and that's why he's not here anymore because it was such a bland offense such an easy offense for defenses to figure out and you heard opposing players last year there were times after games they would talk about what the Eagles were going to run there we already knew what was going to happen it was so easy to figure out on film and Jason Kelsey said after the season yeah. that one of the things they had to do was get more creative right with the offense it lacked creativity and Travis even said to him on the New Heights podcast <laughs> he was like what well, are you trying to say the coaches didn't you know have enough flexibility he's like Kind of, yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. we, we, we lack the, the creativity. And, you know, I know Jeff from Motion City chimes in and says, what about the play that Hurts and AJ Brown drew up in the state against <laughs> the Seattle Seahawks? That's part of the reason. Why would the players think they have to draw up a play if the coaches were giving them more variety in the offense? And by the way, that was also a predetermined throw because only a bunch of players on the field in the fourth quarter would say, you know what we should do? Let's throw deep to Quez Watkins. No coach is saying, let's throw deep to Quez Watkins right. in the end zone and not throw it to Brown, Smith, Goddard, and a partridge in a pear tree. No, only a bunch of players who play a lot of Madden would say, <laughs> hey, bro, you know what we should do? Here's a good idea. Because here's the problem. For as smart as these players are, for as much time they spend studying tape and everything, you know what they don't have in the middle of the game, Nick? They don't have the bird's eye view from the coach's box. No. They don't have the in real time views that coaches have of the whole field. So it doesn't matter if the quarterback is Peyton Manning, Tom Brady, Joe Montana, Johnny United, Dan Marino. At some point, the coach can see more than those quarterbacks can. And that's a big reason why that bad play was made in the Seahawks game. Because when you're drawing up a play in the sand, as Jeff from Ocean City says, <laughs> it's one of the reasons why the players have limitations. Because there's a huge difference between, hey, we're coming to the line. And I've heard a lot of people talk about this, about how like almost every play in the NFL is an A and B side. You know, it's like right. every play when you go to the line... When the quarterback audibles, he's not always audibling to a brand new play. He's audibling to the second play that was called in the huddle. Right. So there's a huge difference between saying, hey, we're going to go to the second option this play. Or maybe there's something in the playbook. Like I heard um, Travis Kelsey talk about how there are three, four plays out of one play for the Kansas City Chiefs. So if we project that to other NFL offenses, let's say that there's three plays that are split off of every play. You know, it's like, um, you ever watch the, uh, the quarterback show on Netflix? Yes. Yes. Yeah. You know Kirk Cousins used to explain how it would be like, you know, he said, you know, you know, Z22, but if I say X22, right. it's a different play. Or if I say, you know, brown, brown X or yellow X or blue X, it's a different play. Like yeah. all of these variables. It's coded the, differently. Right. But they all come out of one play. So, there's very possible that, you know, we got to remember that there's a huge difference between if Hertz is walking up to the line with two or three plays to call and he audibles from one to another to another versus let's draw up a completely new play in the sand. And I'll even add this. Do you remember going into last year because of the prior um, relationship that Brian Johnson and Jalen Hurts had? We all thought, oh, this is going to be a great match, right? They've known each other for sure. a long time. Like Brian Johnson's known Hurts since he was, I guess, what in preschool, kindergarten, or whatever. So Something like that. They've yeah, they've known each other for a long time, and we thought, okay, this dynamic could work. 
it just did not mix well, and it was just too bland of an offense. And that's the change you're going to see this year, I think, with Kellen Moore. I mean, he's, you know, he's worked with really good quarterbacks. I don't know if I call Dak Prescott really good. I call him okay. He's, he's fine. You know, in, in Dallas, fine. But you know, he worked with Justin Herbert, and you know, he was a quarterback himself. So. I think with the Eagles and Jalen Hurts this year, it's about being more creative, not showing what you're going to have, like what the play is going to be beforehand and having a tell every single time you go out there because that, that can hurt an offense. And that's why we saw them struggle so much offensively last year because the defense knew what was coming. If the defense doesn't know what was coming, it makes it much harder to stop. And when you have playmakers like A.J. Brown, Devontae Smith, Goddard, now Saquon Barkley, you have to get all those guys involved and be creative. If you don't have a creative Creative offensive mind leading the charge and getting those guys involved, you're going to get what happened last year again. And I think Kellen Moore is going to bring that creativity, that motion we looked for um, to disguise what plays are going to be happening on the field throughout the season. Because you can't you can't have what happened last year and be so predictable each and every time you have a drive. Mark from EHC brings up an interesting point at 609-403-0973. Mark says, this is even more reason why the first string has to get play in the preseason. You can't use those first two real games as practice games anymore to ramp up. That's from Mark and EHT. That's an interesting point. Well, that's what I mentioned. I mean, you're not going to be seeing these guys in the preseason anymore. Like you, it's That's kind of the but new thing, we? right? I think so. The Chiefs play in the preseason. Yeah, I, I'm with you. I'm with it. I'm with Mark. I, I think that you should see these guys in the preseason, especially when your quarterback is publicly saying 95% of the offense is new. Go out there and get the reps in. Like, training camp is not the same as game speed. It's so not you, the same. So, for example, I, I feel like, Nick, you and Mark at EHU would be in the same boat yeah. against the idea that Inner squad practices are as good as a preseason game. Heck no, the guy you got to get in game, in game in game reps. That has to happen. And I I get everyone's so scared to death to get hurt. I understand that, but you got to send them out for a quarter or two or something, a half in these games. You don't have as many preseason games anymore. So that's another aspect to this. They're not going to be playing four preseason games. They're playing. They could play in two. So, you know what I mean? Like, if you're not getting the reps in the preseason and at game speed, it's not the same as training camp, then you're not going to get the same feel as when you go out there week one and you're going to be learning on the fly in important games that matter. That That's, I, I think you got to get those in-game reps at game speed. The, the training camp is not the same. It's just not. It's interesting because it depends on who you ask, right? Yeah. You know, I've, I've heard some coaches and players put a higher value on the inner squad practices in the preseason games. I, I've heard other people say that you can't simulate game speed. You can't. So I, I'm, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to remove myself from the <laughs> argument, but I'm, I'm just saying I, I've seen both sides. I, I've yeah. heard, I've heard both arguments and, because I never played professional football, uh, for a variety of reasons, obviously, um, I am not Neither going, I. I am not going to act like that I know the right answer to that. But I, what I do know is that there is obviously some sort of differentiation between the two. And I wish I had a better answer for what that is. Yeah. It's just like, do you remember like the, over the past couple of years, how slow of a start each team has gotten off of? And we've talked about kind of the product of the NFL, right? How much does that have to do with not getting the in-game uh, the reps in the preseason? That, that, that's something to do with that. I, I, I very much believe that the product the NFL has been down a little bit, especially in the early weeks, because they're essentially turning into preseason games. These are the first uh, game speed reps that the starters are really getting for most of the NFL because they're not playing in the preseason. That's why we've seen the product kind of come down a little bit and not be, I guess, over the top as, as strong as we've seen in years past because you're not getting those reps in preseason. I, I, I understand the our other side of the argument though. I get it because you don't, you know, you don't want to get guys hurt. Everyone's worried about that too. But, and, you know, they think they can get more in practice. Fine. I, I understand that point of view, but I think it's so important to get those reps in the preseason because when you get to the regular season, these games matter more and they're acting like preseason games essentially because you didn't get those reps early on in August. Yeah, it's interesting. And, and, and just to get to the, the number side of this. There are some stats that I wrote about at 973 ESPN. I want to give to you, Nick, real quick to get your reaction because I wrote about this on the website. I said, 
one of the differences between Moore's offense and the Eagles is that over the last three seasons, Nick Sirianni's Eagles offenses, the top two running backs averaged 75 targets per season. Under Kellen Moore in the four years in Dallas, Ezekiel Elliott and Tony Pollard combined for 97.7 targets per season. So you are looking at a average of 20 more pass targets per year for the Eagles running backs moving forward. What is your reaction to the idea of seeing more running backs catching the ball? I love it. I absolutely think it's fantastic. I mean, that's why you go out and get a Saquon Barkley, right? Get this guy involved in the passing game a little bit. We talked about the creativity, Josh, of the offense. If you're able to get a guy out in open space, set up some screens for a guy like Saquon Barkley, we know he could take it to the house, right? Mm-hmm. So I'm I'm all for that. I want to see them get get their running backs more involved in the passing game. I think that's that's fantastic because we know how good the Eagles are when they're able to run the ball and get their running backs involved in years past. Now you have an absolute stud three down back in Saquon Barkley who you want to get involved in a variety of ways ways and disguise what you're doing on offense. I think that I'm I'm a big proponent of passing it out of the backfield, especially when you go and add a guy like Saquon Barkley in this backfield who's a three down back and can take it to the house at any point. We're going to get more some differences between the Kellen Moore offense and the Eagles offenses in years past coming up next on the Sports Bash. Plus, Cole from LBI texted in, and I strongly disagree with his take on the Eagles offense. Mm. I'll tell you why coming up next. Josh Hedding, Nick Earnshaw live in the Yosha Casino Resort Studios here on 97.3 ESPN. Filling in for Mike Gill on a Monday afternoon. Keep your text coming in. 609-403-0973. Your DMs into the 97.3 ESPN mobile app powered by First Bank of Seattle. And don't forget still to come. Football for Jeff Mosher joins the show coming up at 4 p.m. You're listening. Ah. <sighs> The comfort of your favorite seat is now your comfy car-selling command center, thanks to Carvana. It doesn't get any better than this. Your favorite seat's the best spot in the house. Make it even better by entering your license plate or VIN and getting a real offer in minutes. There really is no place like home. And speaking of home, Carvana will pick up your car from yours after you finalize your offer. Visit Carvana.com or download the app and sell your car from your comfy place. With Mike Gill. When I'm driving, I got a guy on the radio who talks to me. I can't see him, but he talks to me. On 97.3 ESPN. 332 here on the Sports Bash. Josh Henning along with Nick Earnshaw filling in for Mike Gill. Here on 97.3 ESPN. 3 o'clock hour being brought to you by Broadleys Plumbing, Heating, and Air Conditioning. Broadleys is your trusted source for heating and plumbing installation for generations. Call them at 609-390-3907 or visit them online at broadleys.net. All right, before I get to the other stat I had for you, Nick, I didn't want to ignore Cole from LBI. Just because someone doesn't agree with me doesn't mean I'm going to ignore them at 609-403-0970. But I think it's a bad take from Cole from LBI. So, Nick, you can be the arbiter of this back and forth between me and Cole, Okay. Am I all if I turned your microphone? Yeah, that'd be, so. that'd be good. Nice. Yeah. There we go. There we are. Yeah, yeah. It... <laughs> I know you want to silence me, Josh, over here. Some of my takes. I know you don't want to hear from me, but it's all right. I'll be the arbiter here. Well, th- this time I'll let you talk, okay? How about that? <laughs> no, um, I'm good. So Cole from LBI says, I think the Eagles offense is going to be a bleep show this year. Hertz needs someone in his ear with the answers. He always has had someone doing that. And I think Moore's answers will be too aggressive for Hertz. Also, if Hertz isn't as athletic as he was in 2022, then 2024 will look like the second half of 2023. Hertz had a career low yards per catch throwing last year, and he looks slow because he was beat up. That's from Cole and LBI. So I aggressively disagree with this, and here's why. So, first of all, if you go through Hertz's career, right, unless you are going to tell me that guys like Mike Loxley and Brian Dayball and Bill O'Brien and uh, Steve Sarkeesian and Lane Kiffin were all, like, elite people in Jalen Hurts's ear, then maybe I could rock with that. <laughs> If you're going to tell me that Lincoln Riley is the reason why Jalen Hurts was a Heisman Trophy candidate 
maybe that's your theory, right? If your theory is that he is not as good of a quarterback without Shane Steichen, maybe it has some weight. The problem is, is that if you are assuming that basically, and I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, Cole from LBI, but what you're basically saying is that Hertz is too much of an idiot to learn the playbook and that he is easily manipulated by the coordinator in his ear. I think that is a very gross assumption and projection onto a player where, hey, guess what? You point to a career low yards per catch last year. I point to the fact that he had 99 intermediate passes and none of them were interceptions last year. So whose stat has more value? The problem with arguments like this, Nick Earnshaw, is that what you're doing is, is you're not, you're doing the old axiom that, you know, it's facts versus true facts. There are facts that we find and support our arguments. And then there are true facts that actually create the argument for us. I feel called from LBI because you have a predisposed opinion of Jalen Hurts that you are looking at it already negative instead of seeing that Kellen Moore can be a positive for the Eagles quarterback. Yeah, I, I'm with you because, you, I mean, you could just pull, you could pull any stat to support your argument, right? I mean, anyone could do that. I just think when it comes to Jalen Hurts, you already had, you, it seems like Cole already has this preconceived notion that he's not going to be able to run this year, right? Like he's not going to be able to do what he's done in the past. And because of the new, you know, the new offensive coordinator in Kellen Moore, that He's going to struggle because of this. Like, like Kellen Moore is going to be too much for Jalen Hurts to handle. I, I just don't believe that. I don't believe that whatsoever. I, I think they'll be fine. I think Hurts will be okay. I listen. He, he might have been banged up last year. That that's fine. But I, I just can't see them going back and reverting back to what happened last year because you do have different voices in there uh, in the, this season, right? You have you have Vic Fangio on the defensive side. You have offensive side. You have Kellen Moore. Like you have different voices in there. I don't think I think Jalen Hurts will be fine. I, I just don't believe in this thing that, oh, he you know he just needs someone to zero the whole time, and it just might be too much for him. I, I'm just, I'm not on that train, Josh. Yeah, and I feel like in order for someone like Cole from LBI to take that position, you're making the assumption that Hertz is just not an intelligent enough quarterback. Right. And I, I feel like if you go through Hertz's playing career, whether it was college or the NFL, he's never been a high turnover, high interception guy until last year, right? So, you know, I don't think it's fair to say that Moore is too aggressive for him or, you know, the look at now Colt from LBI says it's yards per carry is what he meant, not yards per catch. But again, yards per carry doesn't answer the question. See, you're looking at it as he's a running quarterback. Hertz has always had this apprehension to running the ball. He only ran the ball when he needs to. He's not like a Michael Vick or um, a Steve Young that leaned into their running ability more than their throwing ability. Hertz has always been a guy who saw running the ball as not the primary option on a play. So I don't care what his yards per carry are because guess what? Half those carries were, you know, Philly special, you know, push, tush, push or whatever we're calling it at this point. The plays even. So like if you take out all of those tush pushes, Nick, I don't know how that affects the yards per carry, but I'm assuming it does. You know, I mean, it's it is a carry when he does the QB sneak on the fourth and one. So I don't factor in the yards per carry as a as a measure of anything. I'm looking at it of who he is as a quarterback because that's who he is. He's a quarterback, and I'm going to judge him as a quarterback. I'm not going to judge him as a runner. I'm not going to judge him as a scrambling or a mobile quarterback because at the end of the day, unless your name is Kirk Cousins, everyone in the NFL today (laughs) is a mobile quarterback on some level. Right, and you see that across the league, like the threat to run. Like, that's what makes Jalen Hurts so good because if he can pass it, which he can, uh, he he also has the threat to run and get creative uh, with his legs. And I, I think... You know, that, that's important, an important aspect to of the offense. So I, I just, I don't believe that he's like not this intelligent quarterback because I think he's extremely, an extremely intelligent quarterback. Um, and I, I think they'll be okay with Kellen Moore coming in here and, you know, disguising the offense a little bit better and putting in a system where you're disguising yourself and not putting Jalen Hurts into harm's way as well, right? Like having him you know, throw, you know, have, have more turnovers than he's, than he's had in previous years, right? 
Like his numbers were up with that because the offense was so bland last year. You don't want to see him be put in positions where, oh, you know, he's going to be throwing all these interceptions this year or he's going to fumble because he the first read wasn't there and he doesn't know where to go after that. I think they'll be okay. I, I just... I don't believe in this notion that Jalen Hurts is just going to all of a sudden stink uh, and be this awful quarterback. I, I'm just I'm just not a believer in that because that's not his mentality and that's what, not what he's shown in the past. He's shown that when you doubt him, he'll, he'll be okay. Brian EHT agrees with you, Hello. Nick, at 609-403. Right, so Brian EHT says, you can never bet against Jalen Hurts. He always does his best when he's back against the wall, when people hate on him. So keep the hate coming because oh. he will be at his best. I'm with Brian on that one. How about that? Me and Brian on the same wavelength. Josh. Yeah, look at that. Now, the, the other stat I told you I want to give you about Kellen Moore's offenses, right? So, over the last three seasons under Nick Sirianni, Eagles tight ends, if you combine all the tight ends, Nick, they are averaging 4.3 touchdown catches per season. Kellen Moore, between the four years in Dallas, combined with the one year with the Chargers, Kellen Moore called offenses. The tight end is averaging almost eight touchdown catches per season. It's actually 7.88 is the number, but I rounded up to eight just to like, you know. But the point is, is that, so you're averaging almost four more touchdown catches for tight ends in Kellen Moore's offense compared to Nick Sirianni. Yeah, and I think that's a huge reason why I like this hire, because... They're going to get the running back involved, right? We talked about that before the break. They're going to get the running back involved in the passing game. They, they, Kellen Moore offenses have gotten the ball to running backs about 20 more times than Nick Sirianni led offenses, right? So I, I think by getting the tight end involved and getting the running back involved, you're going to see Kellen Moore do something where he's going to be able to get everyone involved, right? Get the, spread the weapons around, right? It was too one dimensional. It felt like Jalen Hurts would always have to go to AJ Brown, AJ Brown, AJ Brown and just target him last year. It was so one dimensional, Brian Johnson's offense last year. This year, I think you're going to see more of the ball getting spread around. Now, I don't know how great that'll be for for uh, fantasy football players <laughs> when you draft an Eagles player. But I think you're going to see, like, what was it, a couple, how many games in was it last year until Dallas Goddard scored a touchdown? Like, we kept waiting for them to get Dallas Goddard involved. Like, you have all these weapons. You need someone at the helm to be able to get the ball to each one of these guys in a way that's going <laughs> to move the offense down the field instead of becoming predictable predictable and getting it and being one dimensional and ju- just getting it to one player get all the talent you have involved that's why you're paying them. that's why they're here you didn't see that as much last year even though Devonte smith had a quiet 1000 yard season you want to get your running back involved you want to get dallas got involved in the passing game i think you're going to see the creativity of kellen moore on display this year dallas got his first touchdown last year was week five yep. and he had a catch in week Seven touchdown and no more until week sixteen. Well, he got hurt too, so that was he did. Was but it's it's still too. the note that five he, weeks in he came back and played one, two, three games before he scored a touchdown after the injury. Yeah. So what was that? It was against the Rams. He scored that first touchdown, I believe, right? Week five last year. Yes, against the Rams. Yep, he had a touchdown against the Rams and the Dolphins. Mm-hmm. And then no more until the Arizona game, which they should have won, but they lost. Yeah, that's a weapon you want to utilize. You want to get your tight ends involved and scoring in in the red zone. Like they had problems in the red zone. That you got You have so you have so much talent on the offensive set, uh, side of the ball. You got to you got to spread it around and get creative down when you're in your inside the twenty. So I think you're going to see that a little bit more. Um, and I think I think they'll be fine. And when you have players like that, and AJ Brown, Dallas Goddard, Devontae, Saquon, um, I, you got to be able to get them all involved. And I think they will. But for those who are wondering, under Shane Steichen the year before, Goddard had three touchdown catches the entire year. Week three against Washington. Um, let's see here. I got to scroll down. Oh, uh, week eight. Against Houston, which almost nobody saw because the Phillies were playing that night. And then week nine against Washington. So he actually scored both Washington games, two of his three touchdown catches in 2022. Yeah. I, Dallas Goddard's a guy I feel like has just been underutilized by the Eagles at times, especially last year. They just, and I know he's, he's had some injury issues. But he, they, they, they got to find a way to get him involved and take the pressure off the outside receivers, right? Like you have all these weapons, use them. Use a guy like Dallas Goddard. He's there for a reason. Like use your guys that they they drafted, like like Dallas Goddard. I mean, they've they've had really good tight ends over the years, right? Brent Selleck. Then you had Zach Ertz, and now you have Dallas Goddard. 
I don't think they've utilized Dallas Goddard as much as they probably should have, like they did with a Zach Ertz and a Brent Selleck. He's Nick Earnshaw. I'm Josh Hennig, filling in for Mike Gill here on 97.3 ESPN Live in the Ocean Casino Resort Studios. Still to come, football and four with Jeff Mosher, powered by the Inside the Birds podcast in about 15 minutes from now. Also, still to come, we will get into the conversation with the Phillies as well. Bob Wankel from Crossing Brawl will join us later in the show. Coming up next, though, I have a question about not the offense. For the Eagles. We're talking a lot of offense this hour. But one of my biggest takeaways, Nick, from minicamp was about the defense. And we're going to get into that coming up next. Josh Jennings here on 97.3 ESPN. Nick Earnshaw joining me here in the studio. Filling in for Mike Gill on a Monday afternoon. Summer concerts, pool parties, chill nights under the stars. We're stocking up our closet so you're ready to look your best for all of it. At Plato's Closet in West Ashley and North Charleston, we're buying all things summer. So bring in your tees, tote bags, sandals, sunglasses, and more. We pay cash on the spot for gently loved name brand looks. Plato's Closet is the go-to destination for trend-forward teens and young adults who support local and shop sustainable. Visit Plato's Closet today. Plato's Closet, located in West Ashley on Sam Rittenberg Boulevard and North Charleston on Rivers Avenue. The Sports Bash with Mike Gill on 97.3 ESPN and the free mobile app. 351 here on the Sports Bash here on 97.3 ESPN. Josh Hennig filling in for Mike Gill along with Nikki Earnshaw here in the Ocean Casino Resort Studios. 3 o'clock hour being brought to you by Brawldy's Plumbing, Heating and Air Conditioning. Brawldy's is your trusted source for heating and air conditioning services along with plumbing for generations Installation, service and maintenance, call Broadleys at 609-390-3907 or visit them online at Broadleys.net. All right, I was going to talk about the Eagles defense here, <laughs> but we got to save this because I just learned a very disappointing factoid about Nikki Earnshaw. So, which, first of all... I don't think this is true, by the way. Okay, so <laughs> I, I, I saw... Uh, a preview during the break that the production is underway for Knives Out 3. So, you know, the, the popular movie with Daniel Craig is kind of like a, a, a half parody, half not of like, you know, Sherlock Holmes and Hercule Poirot kind of movies. They're like, you know, crime, you know, right. murder mysteries, right? Yeah. And it's always got these like great casts in them. Well, I found out that Nicky Earnshaw has not seen either the first two Knives Out movies. No. To which I asked him, you know, do you really watch movies? So Nick told me literally during the break, I watch sports and Seinfeld reruns. <laughs> That's essentially all I watch. So now I know fun. the real reason why Mike Gill hired you. <laughs> because Mike Gill references Seinfeld more than anything huh. else. Okay? And he watches a lot of sports and he doesn't watch movies. So... I need to know, Nick Earnshaw, what is the last movie you watched? I think the last movie I watched, I was thinking about it. It was Saving Private Ryan was the last movie I watched. And then I was watching a World War II documentary over the weekend. So, like, I'm very boring when it comes to the stuff I watch. But I think that was the last movie I watched was Saving Private What's Ryan. What's the last fun movie you watched? Uh, I rewatch Air a lot. Moneyball. Those are some, some ones I've watched over the okay, past I, couple I weeks. Okay, I will give you Moneyball. All right. That's Have you a- seen Air, the, the one about Jordan? Uh, uh, Matt Damon's in that, right? Yes, Matt yes, Damon. Yes, yeah. that was a very good movie. I thought it, that, that's one of my favorite movies of all time now. I all time. It. All wow. time. That's an all timer from where I thought it was fantastic. It's a big Jordan all-time. guy. It's a big Jordan guy. I loved Air. I thought Air was fantastic. Some people didn't like it. They thought it was too much of an ad for Nike. I don't care. I thought it was a cool movie. I, I like Jordan sneakers. I have the sneaker. Like, I, I, I enjoyed it. So, really that quick. Movie. So, if I asked you to make a list of your favorite sports movies. Yes. Could you make 10? Yeah, of course. I already got them in my phone, essentially. Okay, so <laughs> maybe not today, but maybe a conversation the next time you and I fill in for Mike Gill. Sounds good. We will have a top 10 sports movies conversation. And what I will do for the rest of the show is I will drop some Seinfeld-isms throughout the rest of the show and see if you pick up on it. And I probably won't. <laughs> I'm sure the list, some listeners will. I dropped a few on Friday, if you didn't even if you noticed. I noticed There one. was a couple. There was a couple I dropped. 
There was a couple I didn't notice. <laughs> I only noticed once. If you drop more than one, I didn't notice. I'll, I'll make a signal for you when I drop a sign. Oh, a signal? Down. Yeah, I'll do like, a signal. Like the for middle you. finger? Or like you'll... I'll tell you number one. Yeah, it's a number one show. No, <laughs> yeah, exactly. you're number one. Too. That's what we did when I was in high school. We <laughs> say, we're Cape May Tech, we're number one. Yeah. And we didn't use the index finger. Oh, uh, use a different finger. Yeah. Okay. He's Nick Earnshaw. I'm Josh Hennig. Filling for Mike Gill. Football at four with Jeff Mosher coming on next on 97.3 ESPN. 97.3 ESPN presents the Sports Bash with Mike Gill. It's time for Football at Four, powered by the Inside the Birds podcast. Just hungry to bring back another Lombardi to Philly. Uh, it's, uh, the fans deserve it. Our team deserves it. Uh, culture begs for it. Now live, this is Football at Four. Josh Hennig filling in for Mike Gill along with Nick Earnshaw here in the Yoshi Casino Resort Studios on 97.3 ESPN. Jeff Mosher is back for a Monday edition of Football at Four here on 97.3 ESPN. Jeff, welcome back from the weekend. How are you doing today? I'm great. How are you guys doing? Beautiful summer weekend. Summer-like weekend and uh, day today. Absolutely. It would be much better to be outside than inside on a day like today. So, All right, so I can go? No, I'm <laughs> <laughs> you can go in when we're done with you. <laughs> uh, fair enough. We need to get some out of you, Mosher, first. Come on. we got to get a couple of things out of you first. All right. All right. <laughs> So I, I was listening to this morning's pod you guys dropped, you and Adam, this morning. And it, it kind of parlays into the conversation that Nick and I were having in the last hour before you jumped on, Jeff, which is about the importance of – you can't take anything specifically out of minicamp on the field. But what we can take out of it is I thought it was important what Jill Hurts said, which is that they're still learning a lot of this offense, a lot of this offense to do. And maybe not as a literal 90 percent, Jeff – but it's the idea that Hertz is now learning another new offense. So it, talk to us for a minute for, for someone like you who's covering this team day in, day out. Like, what does that mean to you when they're playing a new offense this year? Well, I mean, I think it, it sort of remains to be seen what, what that all means uh, for the new offense. We obviously hope for, for certain things, right? Um, I just think that for Jalen – this is more than just I'm learning a new offense. This is I'm now learning another new offense, which goes back to college, right? And I, I remember when they drafted him, 2020, Doug Peterson's the head coach, um, and he talked about hoping to find some stability. And then obviously Doug Peterson gets fired, and then uh, Nick Sirianni becomes head coach. And, and he kept going with that theme where he'd love to just have the same set of offensive coaches in the NFL just to be able to – you know, if you take any good quarterback or any good offensive scheme, right, you got a year one of it, you got a year two of it. And by, and if you hope to have that by five, six, seven years, uh, like a Tom Brady and a Josh McDaniel scheme, for example, um, just to just to choose, choose one or, or Breeze and Sean Payton, then by that extra year, so much becomes second nature to you. So much becomes this is what we do and we can build off of it year after year, but we have our base, right? And he's never really had that luxury. And I did wonder, Josh, everybody picked apart his statements about Nick Sirianni as some sort of anti-Nick Sirianni sentiment or maybe just not a pro Nick Sirianni statement. And what I wondered is when you when he was asked the question, what does it say about Nick Sirianni that he's willing to, like, step aside here and bring in somebody in an entirely new offense? Maybe his sort of lack of enthusiasm is that how do we know he didn't actually like the last offense? Because two years ago, he was an MVP candidate in it. And last year, even with the valleys uh, along with the peaks, you almost felt like there were just a few things that needed to be done better. And that was picking up a blitz and maybe having some fresher route concepts, which to me, if you're an offensive mind, right, you're thinking that's something we can retain our base offense, but work on it. We can do better. We can go back and learn from our mistakes and have a whole offseason to do it, but that got just shredded up, right? And now it's a now it's a new offense. So I, I wonder, and I have no idea, only being in Jalen Hurts' head can you really know. I just wonder if his lack of enthusiasm was less about Nick Sirianni and more about, well, I was an MVP candidate in this offense two years ago. Yeah, it got a little stale. We could have freshened up, but now I got to learn an entirely new offense. So with that being said, you know, so you're saying, and I'm not sure if it words your mouth, so that's why I'm asking you to clarify 
So mm-hmm. I, I feel like what you and Adam talked about this morning, what you just said here, is that it's not that Hertz is unhappy with Sirianni. It's that Hertz is just like, you guys don't understand how much work I'm having to go through to learn something new again. You know, a guy who had, I, I believe it was from his senior year in high school to 2022, a different offense coordinator in his year every football season. Yeah, let, let me let me be perfectly clear for all of our listeners, your listeners, our listeners, crossover listeners. We have many and thousands, and we love them. I, I don't. I'm going to repeat. I don't know. Only you would have to be in Jalen Hurts' head, or tie him down to a chair and attach a polygraph to him to really truly know. And I have at times, and I think everybody has wondered about his feeling about Nick Sirianni. And I think I mentioned on the podcast in the Super Bowl when they're reviewing. Right. Devontae Smith sideline <laughs> catch and Sirianni puts his hands up like first down and Jalen brushes it down. Those are little <laughs> incidents that make you wonder, like, how does he really feel about his head coach? They're certainly wild, different, wired why, why differently. Nick Sirianni's, uh, wears his emotions on his sleeve. He's hot headed and Jalen Hurts is more of that Nick Saban, like, we don't show anybody anything, no reaction, you know. So, so they are different in that regard. And maybe there is some, lack of true love <laughs> that that but i'm just saying like i don't think anybody has stopped and wondered about everybody's so excited about the new offense nobody has really stopped and wondered do you think jalen hurts was okay with the offense that you know for one year he was an mvp candidate in and then just maybe in his mind could have used some refreshing some tweaks now he has to learn another new offense we all saw what happened with jason campbell who was a really nice quarterback at Auburn in college, but had a lot of different coordinators. And then in the NFL from Washington to Oakland to uh, I think one other spot, it seemed like he had a different offense coordinator every year. And he talked about how difficult that was. Hey, Jeff, I want to switch gears a little bit to the defensive side of the ball. And we know how, how many corners this team has. They're deep at corner. <laughs> they signed a ton, right? I, I'm wondering about a guy like Eli Ricks. Now, Ricks had, they got a lot of run last year, got a lot of opportunity. They didn't really use them on the outside. They kind of used them on the inside a little bit at, in nickel. I'm curious to what his outlook is for this year and if he will make the team. Yeah, that's a great question, Nick. And here's another guy in a similar situation, but on the other end of the spectrum, where last year sucked defensively. Um, but for Eli Ricks, when the dust settled, that coaching staff, they liked what they saw from him enough so that they moved him inside, had him working there. The Mario Goodrich experiment lasted about two weeks, and then it was Eli Ricks, and, you know, he got consistent playing time. But guess what? He wakes up now, and he looks at Vic Fangio and um, Christian Parker, right, and the new DBs, uh, the safeties coach uh, that they brought back from Miami, who's the Joe Casper, and he's like, I don't know how these guys feel about me. Right? I mean, I got to reprove myself, but now I have to do it with Isaiah Rogers in the fold with year two of a fourth round pick and Keely Ringo in the fold. So he, I mean, he's going to be in that position, Nick, of having to prove himself anyway. Um, I think though last year gave him at least some good experience and some confidence where he can go into camp saying, I don't care what it looks like right now. Right now it looks like Ringo right now. It looks like Rogers, right? It looks like I'm fifth. You know, if you add Cooper to Gene and Mitchell and Slay, I'm a, I'm on the outside looking in. But if you remember, Josh Job last year had a great camp and was the flavor of the week as soon as James Bradbury got hurt, but then he wasn't two or three weeks later. So there's an opportunity, whether on special teams, nickel, outside, to go have a good camp and make this team. Talk with Jeff Mosher from the Inside the Birds podcast, InsideTheBirds.com. Get your podcast at uh, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, also on YouTube. Just search Inside the Birds. Speaking of the defense, I, can I, I want to – Bring back a comment that you and Adam and Andrew talked about. I think it was two months ago about there's a difference between having a lot of corners and having real depth. So for you, Jeff, is there real depth on this team compared to last year or do we just have a lot of corners on the roster? Well, uh, I mean, to answer that question, we sort of have to make some assumptions, right? We have to make some assumptions that Quinion Mitchell and Cooper DeGene are going to be good players. It's easy to make that assumption, but if you go back through the last 20 years of Eagles drafting cornerbacks, it would be easy to do the opposite and say these guys are going to suck. Sure. Right? I mean, because literally every corner the Eagles have drafted, whether it's round two, three, four, or whatever, has not worked out for them. Um, but I have a feeling it's going to, I have a feeling the law of average is going to catch up here, right? 
So between Slay, well, assuming Slay is Slay, right? You got Dijon, you got Mitchell. I, I got to think like one or two of the guys we just talked about, whether it's Rogers, Job, Ricks, Ringo, one of them is going to be a decent backup. So yeah, I think they're they're deeper, but it is true that you can't necessarily call it great depth because you just don't know. I don't think James Bradbury is beyond team. And at some point, guys, the one thing that's the toughest thing to do, in my opinion, from fans and reporter, is we're pretty good at projecting who we think is going to improve from a year-to-year basis. We are terrible because it's an inexact science of predicting who's going to fall flat on their face and not live up to expectations. I don't think anybody would have thought going into last year that James Bradbury, the reigning All-Pro, was going to be benched by the end of the year, right? So I think you have to look at Slay and his age and just wonder, like, when is that point going to come where he has his James Bradbury moment? And he's about to be 30, he's 33, right? If I'm not mistaken, he's going to be 34. But for now, we're going to say, hey, this is a good starter, quality player, and he's part of what gives them good depth. Slay is 33, turning 34 on January 1st of next year. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I, I want to move to another side, the other side of the ball, back to offense and the depth over there at wide receiver. Paris Campbell, John Ross, like these are guys that have come in and now they've signed them. What, what, are, what is the outlook there at wide receiver right now? Because after AJ Brown, Devontae Smith, I mean, there's just so many questions there. Who would be that third guy? I guess Campbell would be at this point, Jeff. Right. So this is a great example, Nick, of what we talk about where you may have bodies, you may have names, <laughs> you do not have depth. This is not a deep wide receiver core unless you get some miracles happen. Like John Ross looks like the John Ross of, uh, well, he's never really in the NFL. Like the John Ross of Washington, okay, (laughs) University of. Or if Paris Campbell looks like the Paris Campbell, who stays healthy, first of all, and looks like the Paris Campbell of what? I think Ohio State, right, is where he's from. Um, So, I mean, to be honest with you, neither of these guys have performed at that level in the NFL. So it would be a very, very big reach to say, that they're going to step up and seize position. They may make the team, but that they're going to be really vital. I'm, I'm high on the rookie that they drafted in the fifth round, uh, Anaya Smith, Texas A&M, but he's five foot nine. I mean, and he's fifth round pick. So yeah, I mean, there's going to be a lot of names, Joseph Nagata, Johnny Wilson, but literally the, you know, the Eagles right now are saying, thank God we have Devontae Smith and AJ Brown, but boy, are we in trouble if any of those guys get hurt or if both get hurt Could you any, s- at any time. Could you see Howie Roseman going out and making a move? We've seen him in the yeah. past go out and make moves but in, during training camp before. Do you think that could be a position where he goes and says, I, I need to make a move and add some more depth here? A hundred percent. But, you know, I would, I would say to you, how many, how many guys, like when are you talking about at, at the waiver deadline when you see those cuts or a real trade? A real trade. I could see a real trade. Could that possibly be a possibility in, in the realm of possibility going forward? It's, it, 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 I, I suppose it's possible, Nick, but then that one would probably be more around the deadline, okay. you know, than, I don't know, they got Ronald Darby in August. I, it's just, it's hard to trade for a number three receiver because right. is that guy, What what's his contract look like? Are you going to extend him right then and there? I mean, is he, if he's a number three receiver, he's clearly not a number one or number two for a reason <laughs> unless there's a, a crowded house there. It would have to be the right kind of guy. I don't know if that guy is out there for them. It, with that being said, because Jeff, I, I personally wrote an article on 97.3 ESPN.com over the weekend and I was doing a little research. Ooh, is it necessary? Investigative journalist Josh Hennig. <laughs> yeah, I have to check this. Yeah, live, live dangerously of, of what I'm doing over here. <laughs> Big J um, journalism. Uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm going to leave that comment from Nick alone. Um, <laughs> no, but the, the the third receiver point is it a moot point though? Because you look at Kellen Moore's offenses, his tight ends average almost eight touchdown catches a year, while the Eagles tight ends have averaged about four touchdown catches a year. In Kellen Moore's offense, the running backs are averaging about 97 targets a year and the Eagles running backs were averaging about 75 targets a year. So is the third receiver as important if Kellen Moore is going to get the ball to other guys to maybe fill that void? Um, yeah, you know, then you, we, we sort of have a discussion about the role of a third receiver. If you're an 11 personnel a lot and your interior receiver um, can't block and you need to run out of 11 personnel, well, you're in trouble, right? right. It doesn't, so at that point, it doesn't matter about who you're throwing the ball to. You need somebody who can be that extra blocker, that crackback block. And then, 
you know, when it's third and five and they're doubling A.J. Brown and they have a good corner on Devontae Smith, third and six, like is, is Saquon Barkley going to run a seven to ten yard route, catch that ball? You know, maybe it's your tight end, as you're mentioning, Dallas Goddard. He's been hurt a little bit. They're not exactly blessed right now with great depth of tight end either. Uh, I get your point on more than one way to skin a cat. And when you're talking about first and second down, sure. But at the end of the day, this game is won on third down percentage most of the time, right? Uh, at least offensively. Defensively, it's usually turnover production. And you need. I think it's it's important to have a functional third wide receiver. doesn't have to be a star. I mean, they went to a Super Bowl with, with uh, Quez, right? Right. But you can make an argument they lost the Super Bowl because Quez didn't make – the catch that he needed to make. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think you need a functional guy there. At Jeff P. Mosher on the Twitter X platform, Inside the Birds podcast, InsideTheBirds.com, all the latest on the Eagles with them. Adam Kappen will be back in tomorrow, and the Jeff Mosher returns on Wednesday when Mike Gill is back here on the Sports Batch. Jeff, great stuff today. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Talk to you Wednesday. Have a great one. Absolutely. Jeff Mosher joining us. Great stuff from him. And I want to take to you, Nick, the question I asked Jeff as well. And the audience out there at 609-403-0973. Your DMs into 973 ESPN mobile app powered by First Bank of Seattle. Force Football 4 being brought to you by Bet365, whatever the sport, whatever the moment. It's never ordinary at Bet365. What is not ordinary, Nick, is the idea that he just said, you might need a third receiver if you're going to go to the tight end and running back that much. Your third receiver is not going to be John Ross. Right. You need the third receiver to be a guy who's going to crack block, who is going to be able to set up the other guys to be open. So if Kellen Moore is going to go to the tight end and the running back more, are you, Nick Earnshaw, okay with the third and fourth receivers not being field stretchers? I, I don't know. I like I don't think it, I don't think you want to be there with a Paris Campbell and a John Ross, right? I think you need more depth. I think you need to go out and get somebody who who can fill that void, right? Like someone who can block, someone who could be a little bit of a possession receiver at this point. I I just I don't think they have enough there, and I think you're going to need a guy um, who you know you got you don't. I think you're worse now than you were with Quest, right? Like you don't have really that guy. Like Paris Campbell's okay. John Ross is coming off retirement, so you really don't have a, a bona fide third receiver right now who you know can go out there and block. Um, you know, they had Olamide Zacchaeus last year, right? Like he's gone. Well, let's go back to 2022. Yeah. Zach Pascal, yeah, Pascal. was on. This. Oh, yeah, okay. exactly. So is is Pascal? If they were to get a guy like Zach Pascal, I'm not, not literally him, right? Yeah, but a guy but like, like that. Are you comfortable with that? Are you, like, you know, you know the guy's not going to go out there and get you 30, 40, 50 catches, but he's going to be a possession receiver who can block. Is that good enough? I think it is good enough because they have Saquon Barkley, right? They have Dallas Goddard, and they have a new offensive coordinator with a, a new vision, right? They're mm-hmm. going to get other guys involved. And like we've talked about throughout the show, um, they'll get – you know, in Kellen Moore's offense, they'll get the the running back involved in the passing game. They go to the tight ends a little bit more than we've seen the Eagles do in the past couple of years. So, yes, I think that type of receiver would be enough. I just don't really see that receiver on this team right now. Yeah, and that's that's the problem. Because let's let's list the guys on the roster right now. Because we know A.J. Yep. Brown, Devonta Smith. Let's just put that aside, right? So you mentioned Paris Campbell. Not mm-hmm. exactly a bona fide three receiver, no. not a blocker, more of like a route running guy, right? Right. Britton Covey, more of like a scat, you know, Wes Welker light esque guy, you know, gets in and out of routes. Again, not a real blocking guy, right? Johnny Wilson, the draft pick, big guy, six foot six, two twenty eight, but he's really a blocking guy. Yeah. Like not really Aeneas Williams, more of like a yard after the catch. John Ross, a stretch receiver, is this where Joseph Ngata comes in? Could yeah. Joseph Ngata maybe steal a role on this team because he embraces that kind of role here? Right, and that's like where you would hope Ngata would be that guy maybe to step up and be a little bit of, of a surprise, right? Like maybe they, he's the guy that will surprise people and show, oh, maybe we do have a third receiver on this roster. Um, I, it's just you don't see it right now because he's a rookie. You have no idea what you're what you're going to get out of him um, at this point behind A.J. Brown and uh, Devontae Smith. If they just don't have a guy who's been there and done that before, 
right? So that's something maybe they look at. Maybe down the line, Howie Rose was like, yeah, we really need to get somebody right now and, and go out and find a bona fide third receiver. We didn't really have that with Quez. I mean, Quez struggled mightily and, and dropped big passes in big games. So, and people weren't happy with him. So maybe they do go out and find another name, or maybe they just live with it and see if they can develop one of these younger guys. Yeah, I mean, Quez was really trying to stick a square peg in a round hole kind of thing. So uh, to me, I, I'm i happy he's not here. Honestly, yeah. I, I feel like they, they tried so hard mm-hmm. to make that something that it never worked out, you know, right. so. And he was a guy who could really only run like a go route, right? Like he what didn't run, uh, didn't run routes well, like over the middle. It, it just wasn't his type of, of speed, right? Like that wasn't his game at all. I think he was more of a go route guy. You take the top off, you score a big touchdown and he would drop passes. And that was another problem he had. And, you know, they, he wasn't really used, I think, to his best of his ability and what his game is. 609-403-0973 is the text board. Your DMs into 973 ESPN mobile app powered by First Bank of CLC. Steve from Ventner says you need to go out and get another premier tight end. Hmm. He says maybe you should trade for a guy like Cole Komet. Well, first of all, the Bears aren't trading Cole Komet. No. That, that, that's not happening, Steve from Ventner. But <laughs> I, I, I understand where he's coming from, though. Because, one, you heard Jeff Mosher mention just a few minutes ago that – Dallas Goddard is not state healthy. So we have to keep that in mind. This guy has been injured almost every year. Maybe not to the level that like Avante Maddox has been, but it is true. He has missed multiple games due to injury each of the last few seasons. And you look at the rest of the, you know, the depth chart, right? You sign CJ Uzama, solid guy, not really a guy who's a high volume guy, right? Right. Grant Calcaterra is interesting because he was an elite tight end prospect before the injuries cramped his style. So if he can stay healthy, can he be a bona fide number two tight end? Um, I know that everyone's hoping that Albert O becomes somebody, right? But he didn't become somebody last year. So I'm not confident he's going to do it this year. And I will say, it's not like... um it's not like the Cowboys always had elite tight ends right? when it came to catching the ball. You know, people act like they had prime Jason Witten. Jason Witten was near the end of his career at that point by the time Kellen Moore became the head guy. And they had guys like Blake Jarwin and Dalton Schultz and Jake Ferguson. None of those are exactly barn burners, Nick. So do we need a premier tight end? Or do we just need someone who can run the routes that Kellen Moore wants to run? Well, I, I, I think you have one in Dallas Goddard. I think he is a premier tight end, right? Like, you're going to be able to use him uh, in big spots. I, I think he's a weapon that he's going to have to get involved. I think Kellen Moore is going to have to get the tight end involved in Dallas Goddard. I, I think they're. I don't think they need another tight end. I really don't. I mean, they have, this team has plenty of weapons. They don't need to go out and get another tight end. They have plenty of weapons. They just need a third, like a third receiver that could block, that could do all the dirty work for to get the other guys open for the most part, right? Like, so I, I don't think they would need a second tight end. I think Dallas Goddard is enough, but they're going to be able to, if they, they have so many weapons, they need to get everybody involved. They they need the guys that can do the dirty work and maybe be a possession receiver, catch something over the middle on occasion, right? I don't I don't think a second tight end would be be necessary, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, I don't need a, an elite second no. guy. But I think that if you're not comfortable with the current group, then... I, I'm okay with going to get somebody else now. But what we, would you what would you rather have a tight end or a third receiver at this point? Well, let me throw a wrench into it because uh, Jovan chimed in on the DMs here, and he says Hunter Renfro maybe. Now Hunter Renfro is still a free agent, 28 years old. He's yeah. still out there. Would that satisfy the Nick Earnshaw third tight end desires? Well, third receiver, third receiver, third receiver yeah. yeah. 
I 100%. I think Hunter Renfro would be a nice receiver to put uh, alongside of of AJ Brown and Devontae Smith. He's somebody that could you, you could go out and you can get it, you know, who's on the street right now. He's had some good years with the with the Raiders in Las Vegas. So, uh, he he's had a guy before, he, you know, he's, he's been a guy before that has been a possession receiver, has come up with big catches, you can fill him in into the slot. He's he'll do the dirty work for you as well. I think that could be a guy that should be maybe on people's radar. Yeah, I'm the only problem I have with Renfro is why is he still a free agent? Like if you have a guy who has been that productive, right? right? What what is keeping him from being picked up? He did play 17 games last year. Yep. Now, he was injured 2 years ago. So, are we saying that the injuries have diminished him that much? Are we reading too much into a Raiders team that was a dumpster fire last year and maybe couldn't get on the field? Because right. back in 2021 was his best year, right? But since then, he hasn't been the same guy. By the way, neither is Darren Waller, who retired this <laughs> yeah. weekend. So, you know, there's something to be said with the fact that is Hunter Renfro, is he a free agent because he's asking for too much money? Is he a free agent because he's not healthy? Like, what's the reason why? Right. I mean, and there's other guys out there, too. I mean, there's other guys, like Michael Thomas is out there still. Uh, Corey Davis, McCole Hardman, Julio Jones. Like, there, there's some names that are still out there. Are you, like, buddies with Jovan? Because he literally just DM'd. <laughs> How about Michael Thomas? <laughs> no, I I'm, I pulled up all the receivers that are remaining. So we got <laughs> Thomas, Michael Hardman, Corey, Julio Jones, Russell Gage, uh, Randall Cobbs out, Sterling Shepard. So there's some names that are still out there. Uh, Josh, but I, I, I just think, I, I don't know. I, they, they could go out and sign somebody else. I don't love John Ross at this point, a guy who can do the dirty work coming off of retirement. They just, they have to go out and get somebody else, I think, at, at this point where I could totally see John Ross making the scene for the practice squad. Yeah. And being like a guy that if something happens to AJ Brown or like Devonta Smith for a game or two, right. That he plays. Here's the problem, Michael Thomas. You know, my issue with Thomas is, is that he regressed mightily. Yes. So, you know, is that a guy who is still, like, who, who is more redeemable? Is it Michael Thomas or Hunter Renfro? I would, ooh, ooh, that's a good one. I thought you were going to say John Ross. I was like, ah, oh, that's easy. It's Michael Thomas. Ah, that's, I think Michael Thomas, the injuries have just hurt him badly. And you wouldn't be asking him to be that, like, number one or number two guy like he was with New But Orleans, we saw right? Julio Jones last year. How sure. that was kind of like a meh. Yeah, it was eh. Didn't really work out. I mean, you could go out and get – you could bring Julio Jones back if you wanted to, right? Like, I mean, you could. He's out there <laughs> if you wanted to go and, and try that again. But – he caught a couple of touchdowns for the Eagles, but he did. He, I think it would be Almost better. Would it be better than anything they have now? I, I would think maybe it's a little bit of an upgrade, right? With where they're at right now, maybe you do bring a guy like a Thomas, like a Julio Jones, back into the fold just to play that slot and do the dirty work, pick up blocks, etc., um, to help out the other guys on offense, the other weapons you do have. He's Nick Earnshaw. I'm Josh Hennig filling for Mike Gill here on the Sports Bash on 973 ESPN FM, the 973 ESPN mobile app powered by First Bank of CL. Still to come. Yes, we do still have some nugs lined up for you. Nick's nuggets. He's got some topics on tap and we'll get some weird texts as well at 609-403-0973. Your DMs into the 973 ESPN mobile app powered by First Bank of Seattle City. And don't forget Bob Wankel from Crossing Broad and RedOctoberPhilly.com will join us in about 33 minutes from now here on the Sports Bash on 97.3. We have the perfect traffic. You come with me. The Sports Bash with Mike Gill on 97.3 ESPN and the 97.3 ESPN free mobile app. Four o'clock hour, the sports bash here on 973 ESPN. Josh Eddick filling for Mike Gill alongside Nick Earnshaw. And Nick's Nuggets are brought to you by Bet365, whatever the sport, whatever the moment. It's never ordinary at Bet365. I have a feeling that you don't have three, six, or five nuggets today. I have a three pack for you today. Wow, you have three. Okay. I got a three pack for you today. Because it's a three pack for bet three, six, five. Of course. Of course. Yeah, I I had to come ready today. I was ready to go. I mean, you know, we got an extended version of the nuggets for four hours today. Actually, five. 
So I'll be on game night tonight. Josh. Yes, Nick Earnshaw will be filling in on game night tonight on 97.3 ESPN, uh, allowing me to get some extra work done behind the scenes. <laughs> so I'm very appreciative of Nick helping out today. He's been, for as much as I, I bust your chops today <laughs> on a couple things, I, I do appreciate all the help you've been giving me. I so. should do a bonus nugget just on movies and see if you've watched a couple of the movies I've watched lately or like over the past couple I of have months. seen Saving Private Ryan. I can <laughs> confirm that. You've seen Moneyball and you've seen Air, so you're I've three seen for three. Moneyball, I've seen Air. I would probably, I would probably rate Air over the other two. Over Moneyball? Yes. Wow, really? Because I think the book was better. Okay, that's fair. Because the book, book a lot of times is better. Than like for the movie. example, to me, the worst example of a movie not following a book is Wolf of Wall Street, <laughs> because that movie actually would have been better if they followed the book. <laughs> because the book gets into a lot of the right. why behind the debauchery. Right. Like when you understand the why behind some of the bleep that happens in that movie, <laughs> it actually makes you more invested in right. the characters. Right. <laughs> so. To me, I look at that movie at Wolf of Wall Street, looking at like some of those scenes, like when he's like falling out of the car and he's like so drunk and high that he gets to drag <laughs> himself in and out of the car, right? Like that, if you understood the, how he got to that point, it makes it better. Yeah. You know what it I mean? just adds to it, right? Like to me, I'm a big believer, like, I don't just want the moments. I want the why behind the moments. How, who, what, when, where, and why. Come you know, on, it's like, all it, of it. like if you watch the movie Scarface, like, you know, the, the reason why the great scene where he says you never see a bad guy like this again, the reason why that scene is so significant is because everything that happens up to that moment, you realize he really is that guy. You, like need, you, you understand it more. Right. You need a little bit more context. You wanted a little bit more context in Wolf of Wall Street. Right. Is what because I, I, I knew the context going into the movie. Okay. You yeah. know what I mean? Because you so, already read the book. Right. And I thought the, the book was one of those things where like – I never thought that was a book I would read. You know what I mean? And it literally, I read it in like two weeks. You were done. You were going, you were going in. You were I was blazing chapter, more through than a chapter a day. Like that was like, go to the beach, lay on the beach. Don't talk to me. I'm reading this book. <laughs> this book is insane. I'm getting my glow. I'm getting a tan and I'm reading the Wolf of Wall Street. I'm going to blow by this book every day I go to the beach. Exactly. And that, <laughs> that's literally what it was. And when I watched the movie, I was a little disappointed. All right. That's fair. I listened. The book a lot of times is better than the movie. That's I, why I said the same thing with Moneyball. The yeah. Moneyball book was really it was good. detailed and informative. Yep. And I thought the movie, they didn't take liberties, but you, you kind of felt like they cut some corners. That's fine. I think it was still a great movie. I think it was fantastic. I, I, I put that as like one of my favorite movies of all time. No doubt. No doubt about it. But, right, what, what's, what's your nut? Uh, I, right. I interrupted your segment. <laughs> enough, uh, no, it, it's okay. We're talking about Moneyball, great movies all the time. It's, it's fantastic stuff. And we're talking about your glow when you go to the beach and read. So that's fantastic. All right. We'll move to nugget number one. Uh, and I got to talk about Bryce Harper. So we have a little bit of sound from this as well. And Bryce, uh, over the weekend before the, um, before the London series was talking about the 2028 Olympics and how much he wanted to play it going up in, in a couple of years. Obviously, we have the WBC, but it's not the same. It's not. I mean, people can say as much as they want. It's just not. The Olympics is so worldwide. I mean, WBC is great. It's really cool. It brings a lot of people together, and that's that's what it's all about. But the Olympics is, is something that you dream about playing in. And so if I have a chance to, to put my nation's colors on and represent you know, that on my chest again, like I did when I was 18 and 16, I would absolutely love it. So Harper made a lot of headlines over the weekend for the most part, talking about the London series, et cetera. But I thought this one was fascinating, saying that he would want to play the 2028 Olympics and kind of pause the MLB season for major league players to play in the Olympics. They have the World Baseball Classic, like he mentioned in that clip. But Josh, what do you make of... Harper kind of bringing the Olympic conversation to the forefront because the Olympics is now going to have baseball back again. And, you know, they never really had major. I don't know if they've ever had major league players. I'm not mistaken. I don't think they have. Um, pausing the season, that, that's a lot to do. We saw the NHL has done that in the past. But right. We never saw major league baseball do that before. So I'm all for this, but I couldn't see it happening. No. I, I don't see baseball pausing their season for the Olympics like the NHL does. Um, obviously the NBA is the off season, so it's completely unrelated. Doesn't interfere. 
I mean, if I would, if I was baseball, because to me, the Olympics are another stage of promoting your sport. Right. And like Harper said, it's different. It's bigger. It's worldwide. Like the world will literally watch sports in the Olympics that you don't give a darn about the rest of the year. You know, like, does, did anybody care about swimming except for when Michael Phelps was swimming <laughs> right. a decade ago, right? Like, nobody cares about women's gymnastics until those young ladies are on the Olympic stage. Like, I always tell people, one of, one of the, uh, the Olympics is not the best gymnastics in the world. Women's college gymnastics, when they get to the NCAA tournament version of that, that is the highest level of gymnastics I've ever watched. Like watching schools like Florida and Oklahoma and Minnesota and Michigan compete UCLA at that level. These women are getting tens. Like you get a ten and you get a ten. They're all getting perfect scores. They don't do that in the Olympics. But like the Olympics, because it's a pedigree, because it's viewed a certain way, we don't watch women's gymnastics the rest of the year. We watch it there. Same thing with figure skating. Same thing with track and field. Nobody cares about Usain Bolt except in the Olympics. So Harper's 100% right. Being in the Olympics is different. And if baseball is smart, they would stop in the middle of the season, but they probably won't. No, they, they, they probably won't. And it would be weird because the timing would be so off. Like, you would go into November. Like, the playoffs would be in November. So it would take a lot to do that. They do have the World Baseball Classic, which I think – I like the World Baseball Classic. I think it's awesome. Because they don't have the Olympics, you have that. I could never see them doing it. But it would be pretty cool to see, the, you know, all the major – the best major league players on Team USA, et cetera. I mean, we saw how great that USA-Japan game was when it was Otani versus Trout. Now, let me it, ask you a question. That would be awesome. Let me ask you a question. Yeah. What if baseball says we're not stopping, but the Ooh. teams allow the players anyway – to go to the Olympics. I, I don't think that would happen. I just, I don't think that, that could happen. You know what I mean? Like taking the players off the team. I, I don't know if I'm for that. I think you'd have to stop the season because a lot of the top players would be going. Right. Like what well, you wouldn't, you, you wouldn't be watching the MLB product, right? Like that would take away from Major League Baseball. So let me ask you this. What if baseball only for Olympic years? Shorten the season? Well, that'd be even better, but that one happen. They could shorten the season. My, here's my idea. <laughs> You time out the break for the Olympics with the All-Star game. Like, instead of doing the All-Star game, right? you do the Olympics. So, like, for example, the players who don't go to the Olympics, they can still be in the All-Star right. game. The guys who are going to the Olympics, maybe you just give them, like, a, like a hat tip for the All-Star team. Right. And baseball still has some, like, you know, non- right. Maybe baseball you, season stuff going maybe on. Maybe you extend the season, start it a little earlier in March. Maybe. You could do that and maybe go a little bit deeper The only in problem is, is that, you know, it's like March is it's cold, man. It's cold. It's cold November, too. So you have to start it somewhere, right? Like, because you're going all these months. You go. Because you can't. Regular you can't, season goes in October. You can't eliminate games because of the TV contract. Right, exactly. So, you know, how would, like, how would baseball pause, like, could – all right, here's the theory. You know how the Dodgers and was the Padres went to uh, Korea? Right. Like, would could baseball maybe be like, we're going to do like a world tour at the beginning of the year. Like, we'll go to London. We'll go to Mexico. We'll go to Puerto Rico. We'll go to Japan. We'll go to all these places with domes, right, in these other countries and do a world tour to start the year for the Olympic year. And that would be a way to get away from the cold cities. Possibly. That could work. That, that could work. I'm trying to come I, up with ideas. Yeah, we're, we're trying to help Major League Baseball out because we know the problem they have with scheduling. I, I don't know if I trust Major League Baseball with scheduling. With I the trust way. you better than I would that. <laughs> Especially after this weekend. I mean, you put the London series with, with the Yankees and Dodgers. That's a whole other topic of conversation. But I think it would be interesting to have some of those stars during the Olympics and have major league players play. Cause we saw how great the world baseball classic is. It'd be essentially the same thing with the Olympics. If you had, and, and to have Bryce Harper come out and say that, I think that's a pretty big deal. I don't know if we'll, we'll ever get it. Unfortunately, probably not. Uh, All right. Yeah. Let, let's hit the break real quick and we'll continue with the nugs, nugs, nugs from Nick <laughs> Earnshaw here on the sports bass. Josh Hennig filling in for Mike Gill. 973 ESPN FM. The 973 ESPN mobile app powered by First Bank of Seattle. And an anonymous texter has taken extreme exception with my Olympic gymnastics comment. <laughs> we'll tell you all about it next on 973 ESPN. It's What's the easiest choice you can make? 
Window instead of middle seat? Picking a vendor who sends a great gift basket? Outsourcing business tasks you hate? What about selling with Shopify? Whether you're selling a little or a lot, Shopify helps you do your thing, however you cha-ching. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. From the launch your online shop stage to the first real-life store stage, all the way to the did we just hit a million orders stage, Shopify is there to help you grow. Whether you're selling scented soap or offering outdoor outfits, Shopify helps you sell. Wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash try. Go to shopify.com slash try now to grow your business, no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash try. With Mike Gill. Do I have everybody's attention now? On 97.3 ESPN and the 97.3 ESPN free mobile app. Today with Nick Nuggets here on 97.3 ESPN. Josh and Nick filling for Mike Gill along with Nick Earnshaw. Here in the studio, of course, Nick's Nuggets being brought to you by Bet365. Whatever the sport, whatever the moment, it's never ordinary at Bet365. Nick Earnshaw, take it away. All right, nugget number two, going to go back to the birds a little bit here. Now, we've seen some of these players go on podcasts before, and we just saw last week with Josh Jacobs, right, saying something that really wasn't that true. Sure. Um, Darius Slay kind of had his little moment today. He was was on the Pulp Fiction podcast. The what? He, yes, it, that, that was the podcast he was on. All right. Um, and he was talking about the Eagles' Kelly Green jerseys, and he was asked if they were going to wear them, and he said, hell no, nah, they ain't. That's That was a quote from Darius Slay. That's what he said, that they were not going to be wearing the Kelly Green jerseys heading in next year. However, okay. the Philadelphia Inquirer asked the Eagles to confirm this. They said the Eagles will be wearing the Kelly Greens again in 2024. Despite what Darius Slay said on the contrary, the Eagles confirmed to the Inquirer that the Kelly Greens will be brought back. We just don't know the days or the games yet. But these these podcasts are getting out of hand with the players, Josh. They're saying things that aren't true, and and they're becoming big news and big stories, and it's getting everyone up in a tizzy. Yeah, look, this, this is a problem. I will, I will say, I will admit that, um, look, the, the players, they, they just gotta stop, man. They, they, they gotta stop just talking for the sake of talking. I understand everyone wants their voice to be heard. Everybody wants to have their platform to speak their mind. And I'm all for that. Yes. Okay. But at some point, guys like Josh Jacobs, Darius Slay, and everybody else, the gotta stop trying to speak knowledgeably about things that they don't know about. I'm a big believer, Nick, in if you don't know something, don't act like you know. Yes. You know, like don't double down on it. Right. Like, you know, <laughs> listen, if I don't know something, I look it up, I research it, I ask somebody. If I don't know something, I'm not gonna talk about it. You know, it's just, it's <laughs> or a I'll say role. I don't know it. I don't, or know. I don't know. Right. <laughs> I don't you know. know. Like if there's if there's a movie I haven't seen, I don't know. I can't comment on it. You know what I mean? <laughs> if it was a TV show, you know, you like for example, you have seen every Seinfeld episode that's ever been made. Yeah, probably I, ten times over. <laughs> I have not. I've maybe seen maybe a third of the Seinfeld episodes. You know what I mean? Right. You know, but it's not. So I can't sit here and be like I'm a Seinfeld expert. I would never do that. So right. I don't understand why these guys like Jacobs. And Slay are trying to speak like they're experts on something, and they're obviously not. They're just talking out of their you know what's like. How does Darius Slay know if they're going to wear the Kelly Greens? And by the way, they fought for years to get these Kelly Greens back. They made a ton of money off of them last year. Why would they not bring them back? The rule has now allowed them to wear these Kelly Green jerseys, and I, for him to say that's kind of crazy as well. Like, to, like, oh yeah, they're not going to wear them this year. That that's just crazy. The, the fact they finally got them back and then they're gone the next year. Yeah, highly doubt that would happen, especially with all the money they made last year off the jerseys. And then you had Josh Jacobs last week with the whole thing. You can't wear green to the Brazil game. Like, it's just they got to stop. They, if they don't know, just don't say it because now you're going to create a whole a whole nugget for me to talk about on the sports bash. <laughs> Alright, what's your final nugget? Alright, fourth of our excuse me, third and final nugget. Uh it, interesting comments from Nick Nurse. Okay, so he was on a national radio show earlier today and he discussed uh kind of building around um 
Joel Embiid and Tyrese Maxey, okay? So that's what I've been kind of going at, right? I want the Sixers to build around Maxey and Embiid, not go get a third star. Uh, the quote was, finding the right pieces that are going to be able to space and shoot, defend and rebound, have some IQ, have some late game moxie and guts. That's per our Austin Crow who put out that quote on Twitter for everybody. If you want to check it out, 97.3 ESPN's Austin Krell. So thanks for that, Austin. You helped me out with my third nugget. What do you make, Josh, of Nurse kind of saying that they need a guy with moxie and guts at the end of the game? Um, it's kind of what they need and what they've been looking for for years at this point. Well, it's on it's on uh, point. It's exactly what Daryl Morey said. This is what he said at his season-ending press conference about what they need. The biggest need is, you know, not at their position, someone at the wing who can play and deliver at a high level in the playoffs. That That's the biggest need, yeah. I, it's I on message. That. Yeah. I, Nurse and Morey are on the same page. Yes, that's which what is I a good heard. thing. Which is a good thing. I just don't want to add a third superstar, a max contract. Utilize your resources with a bunch of guys and fill out the roster. So you have guys like uh, uh, Kelly Oubre not being your third best option, right? Like, go get a third guy that can be bona fide, like a Bridges, like a Laurie Markin, and I've been screaming about for so long. And maybe, Josh, there's a guy out there that they, we haven't even heard yet. Even though every name's been linked to the Sixers, maybe there's something brewing that we don't even know about yet. You know what I mean? That could happen, too. Yeah, and I, I think that part of the problem is is that a lot of fans, they want to see a big name. Yep. But, like... I don't. It, it might not be a superstar that makes the difference for this team. Look at the Celtics the last two games. You know why the Celtics are up 2-0? Because of Drew Holiday. Right. It's not because of Tatum and Brown. Because Tatum and Brown have been to the NBA Finals. Drew Holiday has made a massive difference in this series. So, like you said, a Lori marketing. Maybe that's someone who is a superstar, but is someone who brings something to the table that you don't already have. Like an all-star. Just an all-star. I don't need a superstar. I need an all-star. And uh, Podcast P, you know, we're talking about player podcast. His podcast is alright, but he doesn't need to come here. We don't need another player with a podcast either. <laughs> He's Nick Earnshaw. I'm Josh Eddick, Philly for Mike Gill here on 97.3 ESPN. Coming up next, we'll recap the Phillies weekend with Bob Wankel from Crossing Broad on RedOctoberPhilly.com. Here on 97.3 ESPN. Jersey. This is the Sports Bash with Mike Gill on 97.3 ESPN and the 97.3 ESPN free mobile app. Now live from inside the Ocean Casino Resort Studio, here's Mike Gill. Josh Hennig filling for Mike Gill alongside Nick Earnshaw here in the Ocean Casino Resort Studios on 97.3 ESPN FM. 97.3 ESPN mobile app powered by First Bank of Seattle. Phillies in London over the weekend. The high of Saturday, the low of Sunday. We talked about it earlier in the show. And joining us right now to get more into it, Bob Wankel from Crossing Broad, RedOctoberPhilly.com joins us right now here on the Sports Bash on 97.3 ESPN. Bob, welcome back. How you doing today? What's up, man? Good to talk to you. Appreciate you jumping on. So I want to ask you about, you know, first of all, you're, you're just big picture takeaways from the weekend because, you know, for a lot of Philly fans, it was the, the high of Saturday, the low of Sunday emotionally. And I kind of take from it, Bob, it's 162 games. Games like Sunday happen. Yeah, look, they can never just seem to lose in normal fashion. Like, when was the last time the Phillies went out and lost a game 8-2 and you said, well, that's baseball, you're not going to have it every night. Like, <laughs> the pitching has been so good, and they've been so good situationally that they are always in a game, and you're not going to win all of them. And it just it seems like, it feels like when they lose games lately, it's in this, like, rip-your-hair-out fashion. And that's certainly what yesterday was. Um I think it's it's hard to have big picture takeaways from one loss. When you look up, you see that they lead the National League in runs per game. They're second in baseball. They've allowed the uh, fewest runs per game in the National League. Second in baseball, they have the second best run differential. The bullpen has been the best in baseball since May first. The starting pitching is awesome, but you know yesterday was a dismal loss. That was a terrible loss and. If you consumed that game for three hours yesterday and invested yourself in it, you definitely walked away from it going, well, what the hell was that? And, I mean, that's just, like that is going to happen sometimes. 
I said, Bob, coming into the weekend that I felt the Phillies have to go out and add a bullpen pitcher and a right-handed bat before the deadline. You know, I think this weekend amplified that, Bob, because at some point you can't ask Alvarado and Soto and Strom to pitch every single game. Yeah, um, I would agree that they probably are in a position where they could could stand to add another bullpen arm. As good as the bullpen has been, I, I do think that there's a couple potential red flags here. And and the one that I would I would certainly circle is Gregory Soto. I, I think if you look at him last season, his ERA wasn't particularly good. But when you look at some of the advanced metrics, he actually pitched better than some of the traditional stats would indicate. Um, and, and he was sort of victimized by a couple blow-up appearances. This season has been the total opposite. He's been worse, and he's, he's been far worse. Um, he's really struggled to get guys out. Opponents are hitting 324 against him. His whip is over two right now. For a guy that throws 97 to 99 miles per hour from the left side, like you would expect better results, and he just really can't get anybody out right now. And it's interesting. Like If you were managing yesterday's game like it was, it was all in, win or go home, I don't know that you would have gone to Gregory Soto in the sixth inning to record that final out with the heart of the Mets order up. But I will say this, like Gregory Soto is a guy that should be able to get out of that spot. And while I, I think that Matt Strom might have been the, the, the right choice in the moment, you have to you have to see if Gregory Soto is capable of getting that out. And right now he just absolutely is not. It, to what you're saying, Bob, and not to put words in your mouth, Bob Wankel from Crossing Broad, RedOctoberPhilly.com is the newsletter joining us here on the Sports Bash on 97.3 ESPN. Are, are you suggesting we need less of Soto and more of somebody else then moving forward? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that you're in a spot where Gregory Soto is probably your fifth or sixth option out of the bullpen as is. But I do think that you're sort of in this evaluation mode where there's 25 games over 500. You have a nine-game lead in the division. And there's this sense of, okay, what do we have here? Let's put these guys into spots and see what they can handle and what they can't. And so while you're trying to win baseball games, and certainly that's always the focus, there is a little bit of a learning process here about like, what does this team really look like when we're all in down the stretch, when, we're, when we get to October. So I, I think at, at – Best right now, Gregory Soto kind of needs one of those Sir Anthony Dominguez resets where you say, okay, like he's got a good arm. We know that he's performed in the past. Right now it's not working out. Like, I don't think that Gregory Soto should be taking down key outs in games. If you have things lined up where you know, Matt Strom, he should be fresh. He, he, through Tuesday, you, you see him over the weekend. Like it, it shouldn't, guys should have been available yesterday. So, um, Sometimes you're going to have to go to home important situations, but I don't think he's a guy when you have all your all your options in front of you that you want to go to in a key spot right now. So with that being said, why do you think they went to Soto there? Is that is that just the the, the Phillies' brain trust in the dugout overthinking the situation? Is it just a making a, a, a bad decision? Like what what leads in your mind a situation like that? Because. I feel like the fans out there, Bob, they're saying, this is what's wrong with Rob Thompson. Like, that's kind of like the reaction to some of this stuff. Yeah, I mean, it was it was sort of a conservative move, I guess you could say that, by going to him. I, I really do just think it's like, you know, first of all, I heard some people criticizing Rob Thompson for taking out Taiwan Walker. I mean, look, you know, Taiwan Walker was really good yesterday, and uh, it was a good step forward for him, and, and credit to Taiwan for, for battling and and coming out and giving his team a chance to win. But, I mean, nothing that Taiwan Walker has done this season really says, yeah, let's let's go through the heart of the Mets order a third time or go after Nimmo a third time, even if he had success with him earlier in the game. I think what you're thinking to yourself here is, all right, Gregory Soto's a veteran reliever, and he should be able to get out Brandon Nimmo, and he just didn't. Um, and you want to save Strom for later in the game, that's fine. You want him to take down the eighth or possibly even the ninth, and you let him do that. Um so, I mean, you know, again, like if you look at yesterday's game, like it was all in, it was pretty frustrating to watch because I, I in the moment said, why isn't this strong? But when you step back, you think about it, you're like you got to trust your players. You, you want to see what guys have. And it was a big spot for him. He just didn't get it done. This team now leaving London, Bob, they got to go to Boston, to Baltimore, a long, many days away from home. Is there any thought or concern that things are going to maybe not be very even with the rest of this road trip, considering how long of a trip they're taking. 
Yeah, the mileage is certainly added up. I mean, you start in Philly, and then you go out Memorial Day weekend out to Colorado, to San Francisco, back to the East Coast, across the pond. Now you're back in ball. That's a lot of travel for a baseball team, and it does take a little bit of a toll on guys from a physical standpoint. Now they have the benefit of the two days of rest going into the Mets series, and then obviously today was a down day as well. But uh, it, it can be a little bit difficult to be acclimated. Now that being said, uh, Boston has, has been pretty mediocre. Uh, they are league average in pretty much every capacity in terms of their offense. They've gotten good pitching this year, but it, it goes to show you, like we talk about how good the Phillies pitching has been uh, and their 25 games over 500. The, the Red Sox have been fantastic from a pitching perspective and, the, and their 500. So that kind of lets you know where, where they're at from an offensive standpoint. Uh, they do benefit. The Phillies have uh, six games here on this trip. They'll see Zach Wheeler twice. We'll get Nola, Sanchez, and, and you know Walker uh, once as well, and, and then obviously Ranger. Um, you, you get good pitching. You, you're going to have five starts where you feel like, hey, the guy that's taking the ball this, in this matchup is going to give us a chance to win. We've got the better guy. Uh, but, uh, look, Baltimore is really good. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if the Phillies are looking at like a 3-3 three and three week here. But, like, here you go. I, I come on here twice a week, and I, I very rarely give hot takes. I have one for you. The, the Phillies aren't competing against the Braves at this point. The Phillies are competing against the Phillies. The, the Braves are cooked. The, the Phillies are going to win this division, um, and I think that they're going to want, win it going away. Uh, so a 3-3 three and three week I don't think would be a reason to slam the panic button, but um, – you know, I think what the Phillies have to do is protect against that one and five week, uh, and, and you know the the two and the two and seven run. Like that's that's what they're going to have to do because they're not going to stay this hot. They're not going to win 109 games. I don't believe that they will do that. They just got to protect against those prolonged stretches where they can't get things going. And so far, they've been great at that. Bob Weinkel from Crossing Broad joining us here on the Sports Bash. Josh Heddick filling in for Mike Gill on 97.3 ESPN. Bob, a couple more before I let you go. We had a person text in earlier today ask about Kyle Schwarber, if we should be concerned that Schwarber has not hit any home runs yet this month. Are you concerned? A little bit. It's it's weird. He's been he's been okay. Like He's still drawing a ton of walks. He's still getting on base. Uh, but he had 48 singles last season. He's got 42 singles right now. It's just like, and we're not even halfway through the season yet. It's just that he's been such a different player this year. And I wouldn't say that there's a reason to be concerned about him overall. Like he's still a productive player. But, you know, you sort of expect Kyle Schwarber to run into 35, 40 home runs uh, minimum, and he just isn't that guy right now. And I know everyone when the calendar turned to June was like, all right, here we go, like, lock in. And that hasn't really happened, for, at least from a power perspective. So I'm not like overall concerned about him, but like he has not been the extra base hit guy, the power guy that you expect him to be. I mean, his slugging percentage is way down this season, but he has picked it up in other areas to sort of offset that a little bit. It's worth keeping an eye on, but like, am I, am I overall truly concerned about Kyle Schwarber? No, I, I guess I still expect him to go on a run, but does he finish with 40 plus home runs? No, probably not at this point. Bob, before I let you go, I also want to touch base with you because on Friday, the Phillies made a very curious trade, we'll call it. I know for people in South Jersey, they love the idea of acquiring Buddy Kennedy because he is from Millville High School. But, you know, he, what exactly are the Phillies' plans moving forward? Because it feels like they're kind of like doing patchwork until March and Turner come back, you know, with the guys like Weston Wilson and David Dahl up here. So what do you think the Phillies are trying to do the rest of this month because my working assumption is Turner won't be back for at least a couple more weeks and Marsh as you have mentioned before Bob he probably won't be back till the all-star break yeah it sounds like Brandon Marsh is doing pretty well um and it's like I think the question with both Marsh and Turner is this it's like all right could could these guys play in a game seven days from now um uh, and the answer might be yes, but it's just, again, I think it's about the greater context of, all right, we have championship aspirations. We're trying to be healthy. We're trying to be ready to go down the stretch. We want to peak, you know, and it's going to be hard for them to peak as well as they play. So I don't know if peak's the right word, but we want to make sure that we're firing on all cylinders as we get into September and into October. So we want to be really cautious from a health standpoint with these guys. And so, that's where I don't know on the timeline. Like, could Trey Turner play in a baseball game this weekend? I think so. 
is, is he going to be back in the next 10 days? Like, I think that remains to be seen. I think there's a couple more hurdles for him to clear. And I think that they want to be conservative with Morris. He might beat the all-star break timeline that I initially gave, but I just sort of expect them to say, all right, he's doing really well. He's in a good spot, but like, let's be careful here. Um, so I think with, with like Buddy Kennedy, I, I think the idea is basically just build some more depth. You, you need these guys. I mean, look what David Dahl's done for this team, right? Like these moves sometimes pay off. Sometimes they don't materialize to anything. You, you, guy may never take a, in a bat here, but I think the idea is: look, you got a solid player uh, that, that's good from an organizational depth standpoint. If things happen, a couple, one or two more things happen, a couple dominoes fall a certain way. You know, maybe maybe he gets a look. Uh, but I think overall that, that specific move is just about building the organizational depth. I guess I'd be surprised if that moved the needle in the, for the Phillies this season. He's Bob Wankel at Bob underscore Wankel on the Twitter X platform. RedOctoberPhilly.com. Get the newsletter so you get all the Phillies insights you need each week. And he joined us here on the Sports Bash on 97.3 ESPN. Bob, appreciate you squeezing in some time for us today. I appreciate you having me. Thanks for working with me there, Josh. I know I gave you a couple headaches today, so. <laughs> well, the good news is I actually have help in the studio from Nick Earnshaw today, so I'm not totally flying solo by yeah. myself, so. Um, I'm glad to hear that. I'll, I'll try to be a little bit more uh, available here moving forward, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Take Thanks, care of yourself, all right? See Bob Weigel joining us here on the Sports Bash. Josh Teddy Philly from Mike Gill along with Nick Earnshaw live here at the Ocean Casino Resort Studios here on 973 ESPN. So, Nick, for you, looking at what Bob said there, what was there anything that stood out to you specifically? Yeah, I, I he, he did have a hot take saying the Braves are totally cooked, that this is the Phillies division. I kind of agree with him there. I, I do agree with him there a little bit. I think this is the Phil, the Phillies are facing off against themselves, right? Like this is their division to lose now. They they have been really good all year. Um, over the past couple of seasons, right? They've been a wild card team. Right. It's like now you want to be in that position where you're leading the division. You're going to the playoffs where you have those couple of days off. May was that good or bad? I don't know. But because in the past we've seen it, it hasn't been great. But now they're kind of the dominant team across the National League. Like, it's them and the Dodgers, right? The Braves are good. I think they're still going to be there. But I thought that was an interesting take to say they were cooked. I don't know if they're cooked. I, I kind of can see where he's coming from. I still think they're going to be a playoff team. But, yeah, I thought that was interesting. And then the Kyle Schwarber thing, he has been a different player this year. Hitting a bunch of singles. And, you know, remember, he lost some weight over the offseason. Did that play a role? He's had, a, you know, he hasn't had as much power this year as well. He's been hitting a lot of singles. He gets on base per usual. But... But it, it's been more singles and home runs. And we're 10 days into June. We talked about it throughout the show. We haven't really seen June Schwarber show up yet. Uh, maybe that happens in Boston. But I thought the Schwarber comments and the Braves comments were, were definitely interesting from Bob, uh, to say the least. Yeah, I, I would say the Schwarber thing definitely warrants saying keep, keep an eye on, right? Because, right. you know, you mentioned about him losing weight. That was something that I pointed out when he first came to spring training. I remember... You know, we, we've asked guys like, you know, the Scott Laubers, the Matt Gelbs, the Bob Wankles, guys who cover this team day right. in and day out. And they're like, yeah, we've noticed it too. But at the time, nobody really thought anything of it, Nick. And now it's starting to wonder, like, I don't think it's affecting his power. No. But I do think it's affecting maybe his approach to the plate. Maybe. maybe. Because I remember him saying on Jason Stark's podcast back in March, because he was on with Doug Glanville and Jason Bell, like he was aware of how few singles he had last year. Right. And how he was like, I want to have a better batting average. I want to be a better hitter. So, like, I don't think that that means he's not going to hit the home runs he usually hits this year. But it does make you wonder, is his approach at the plate different? Right. And, like, it, it shows in the batting average, right? Like, his batting average is up this year. Everyone complained last year. He was, you know, hanging around 200, under 200, uh, right at that Mendoza line. That's what everyone was so concerned about last year. This year, he, his average is, is way up. You know what I mean? Like this year, he's batting, uh, uh, 235. So it's a big jump from where he was last year, being under 200 for most of the year, right? And, um, you know, now he's not hitting as many home runs. Like he's got 11 home runs so far this season. Uh, yeah, it, the power numbers, it's, it's been different. Um, you know, people asked him, Hey, we want you to get that average up, right? 
He's hitting more singles this year. He's just not hitting as many home runs. I don't know how people feel about that. And then he's also in the leadoff hole. So you want to you want the guy to get on base. He still has the threat to to hit a home run to start a game. You know what I mean? So he's getting those more at bats. Uh, he's he's hitting for a better average. I don't know. I, I think the power will come. It's just he's been a little bit different, like Bob mentioned. It's the share of a player. Yes, yeah. it's, it's not concerning. It's curious. It's, is that is that a good word? Yeah, you're, you're kind of curious about it. I guess you could say, and it makes you wonder a little bit. I wonder if, you know, him losing a little bit of weight has something to do with it. It, it, it messed with his approach. And, you know, even even some of the concerns last year when he wasn't hitting a bunch of singles and it was just home runs or striking out or walking, um, that you know, he took a little bit of a different approach at the dish this year. I don't know if it has anything to do with the weight, yeah. but it, it's something to just keep an eye on as we're in June as the season progresses along. The other thing that Bob talked about was the Gregory Soto. Gregory Soto right. coming into the game yesterday and how he has not been the guy he was the last year and a half, basically. And I have to wonder, kind of, you know, bouncing off of what Bob said, how many more times are we going to go to this guy? Right? How many times are we going to lean into, um, how many times are we going to lean into Gregory Soto being the guy, right? Right. You know, at what point do we turn around and look at a guy like Soto and be like, yeah, we're not going to go to him? Like, at some point, if you're the Phillies, Bob is right. You do have to go somewhere else to somebody else. And he agreed with me. He's like, look, you can't pitch Alvarado and Strom and Hoffman every single day, but you got to go somewhere. And... Look, you know, maybe it's not Soto, right? Maybe it is more Kirkering. Maybe it is more Dominguez. Maybe it is going out and acquiring somebody else. But at some point, I do agree with Bob. The, the Soto roller coaster ride, it's got to be given a timeout. Yeah. I, I'm with, I'm with you because you can't, you can't send Alvarado, Strom, and Hoffman out there every day. Like, they're going to be cooked by the time you get to the postseason, right? You don't want them going way over in innings, et cetera. You got to have other options out of the bullpen, whether it's a Kirkring, whether it's a Dominguez. But the Soto experiment, he hasn't been the same since they really traded for him, right? It wasn't that great last year. Had struggled this weekend as well. Like, that's why maybe you do go out and get a, a bullpen arm, right? Maybe that's what you want to prioritize. Give Rob Thompson another option because Soto can be very dicey, and he's been dicey on the road, which kind of showed you yesterday. They were in London. I, that, that's something to watch for because you can't send the same guys out there every single day. They're going to be cooked by the time September and October comes around. So I, I'm, I'm with you. You don't want to send these guys out every day. But that's when maybe you have to go out and get another arm or utilize, you know, guys coming up and down from the minors. You know, you got the Ortiz of the world coming up, right? They have guys, you know, that they haven't used a ton. Maybe use Turnbull as well in situations like that. Instead of just using him as a long relief pitcher, maybe you'd use him in spots to maybe prepare him for the postseason. That could be another option. So it's something that definitely you're going to watch as the season progresses and into the deadline too if they don't make a move. He's Nick Urshaw. I'm Josh Eddick, Philly for Mike Gill here on 97.3 ESPN FM, the 97.3 ESPN mobile app powered by First Bank of Seattle. Still to come, we're going to have a different variation of the big three today. It is going to be me responding to people on the text board and me responding to stories around sports. And we'll let Nick Earnshaw weigh in. Is Josh going to get a thumbs up or Josh going to get a thumbs down for his responses to these subjects and topics. How about that, Nick? I like it. That's going to be a fun big three today. I can't wait. Well, that's coming up next here on the Sports Bash. I'm Josh Hennig. He's Nick Earnshaw. Mike Gill is on his way back from London. He was, uh, all reports are coming in. Mike Gill will be back in the driver's seat tomorrow. Manana here on 97.3 ESPN. You're listening with Mike Gill. Never thought this radio stunt would catch on so big. On 97.3 ESPN. Josh Hennig filling in for Mike Gill alongside Nick Earnshaw here in the Ocean Casino Resort Studios here on 97.3 ESPN. Don't forget this week, Seize the Deal offer. Jester's Dive Bar in Rio Grande. You can get a $50 gift certificate to Jester's Dive Bar for just $25. 
Fees Deal goes live this Friday morning at 9 a.m. at SeizeTheDeal.com. All right, so we got a version of Big Three here, Nick. So I'm going <laughs> to respond to people. And okay. Nick Earnshaw is going to be the judge of my responses to different topics. Judge Earnshaw over here. Judge Nuggets over judge here. Judge okay. Nuggets. <laughs> <laughs> I like Judge Earnshaw better. Okay. Sounds sounds more sophisticated. Yes, it does. It does. Not uh, you can take me more serious when you use my last name yeah. instead of Nuggets. Earnshaw, <laughs> Judge Earnshaw yeah. will be judging Josh's three. So first, we got to respond to the person who did not agree with my comments on gymnastics. Okay, so let's first read with this anonymous texter. Okay. We'll just call them Mr. 609 because <laughs> I'm not going to read their full number on the radio. That would be that'd be pretty messed up, messed honestly. Up, that'd be – what, what, what do they call that? Uh, doxing? I guess, yeah. When, when you put somebody's information out there? Yeah. Yeah, they, they call that doxing now. Yeah, just use the area code. Yeah, Mr. 609 says, Josh, that's absolutely the most absurd comment I've ever heard you say. <laughs> Top-level collegiate gymnastics better than Olympic gymnast? Ha, 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 ha. Collegiate gymnastics can't sniff the women, the Olympic athletes do. If they could, they would be in the Olympics. Prime age gymnasts are between 15 and 17 years old. So it doesn't even make sense at the NCAA it would be better than Olympic gymnastics. All right. So, Mr. 609, here's the problem you said. First of all, you are projecting a theory and a narrative that is incorrect about women's sports. It's been propagated for decades. And we are now learning in today's world is not true. There has always been this opinion that sports like figure skating, gymnastics and others, that women peak at a certain point and that they athletically cannot perform after a certain age. That has been proven not to be true. For example, one of the most blatant examples that has been proven is women's tennis and women's swimming. We have seen now in recent decades that women's tennis players are actually better now in their 20s and early 30s than they ever have been because women are actually being trained to be tennis players and not just be tennis prodigies anymore. Say that with Katie Ledecky when it comes to women's swimming. Katie Ledecky has gotten better as she's gotten older, not when she was younger. And the reason this is, is what it relates to women's gymnastics. As a certified personal trainer and nutritionist with four certifications in health and fitness, I am speaking as a expert in physiology and health and fitness. Women are now learning how to train and exercise better than ever before. Women are becoming better athletes as they become older. They are not just peaking in their teens and then having a drop-off as they get older. So what you're seeing is, is that for women's gymnastics, look at Simone Biles. Simone Biles is better today than she ever has been. She's going to be in the Olympics this year, and she is murdering women who are like eight, ten years younger than her, murdering them on the gym mats because she is more powerful. She is more athletic right now because she has trained her body to be the most powerful gymnast she possibly can be. You look at women's gymnastics in college, that's why they're better now than ever before because these women are doing quadruple spins and landing them perfectly because they have now trained their bodies to be better as they get older. You're seeing this in women's basketball as well. You know why they're more physical with Caitlin Clark in the WNBA? Because these women have trained their bodies by weightlifting and off-season training to be better athletes as they get older. There's no more young prodigy hit a point and you're cooked anymore. Wow. Wow. I'm stunned, Josh. That was a fantastic response. Thumbs up for me. Thumbs up for me. No doubt about it. I Listen, I, I can't even lie. I'm not a big gymnastics watcher. You know gymnastics in and out. I, I am shocked. You're like the first person I really know who knows gymnastics through and through. So I, I give that answer a complete thumbs up. I, 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 you, you had me a loss of words. That was a fantastic response. Would it you. surprise you that the sport, first sport I ever played was gymnastics? What? Yes, it would have surprised me. I didn't know that. Four-year-old Josh was bouncing off what? the walls and his parents decided the answer <laughs> Was to put him in gymnastics class. How about that? I listen. I am not a gymnastics expert by any means. 
that that is fantastic. I did not know you you started. That was your first sport, gymnastics. Yeah, I did gymnastics oh, for man. anything else. I learned something about you new, like new every day. It's like you and Schwime on the weekend. <laughs> it's like, I do a show with you guys, and I learn something new every time. Like the one time Billy, uh, he had he was he he, he, he drove the monorail. Uh, he just. Out of nowhere, he drove a monorail, monorail in Disney. You, you did gymnastics. I had no idea about this. You learned something new on the Sports Bash, too. I, it's crazy to me. That that was a fantastic answer, by the way. I invite you and others to have a beer with me, and we'll break down <laughs> the women's gymnastics this summer. Yeah, that was that was a heck of a breakdown. That's a thumbs up for me. What a response for the Big Three to start it off. We're, we're going crazy to start this Big Three today. <laughs> uh, the next comment I want to get to is a texter chimed in because we were talking earlier, right? Right. About, we mentioned the Caitlin Clark stuff, right? Right. So Jerry G from Brigantine chimes in. Okay. He says, I've been watching basketball for 60 years. I'm 73 years old. I saw Wilt Chamberlain in the NBA. I saw Dr. J, so on and so forth. Jerry with a G from Brigantine goes on to say, I know basketball. Only problem is everyone else grew up and I didn't. So I've never really watched women's basketball because they always thought it was so boring. But then I put on, Jerry says, the women's NCAA tournament this year because of the popularity of Caitlin Clark. He said within 10 minutes, I could tell she was the best women's basketball player I've ever seen. He said, without a doubt, and for her not being on the Olympic team, I feel it's a disgrace, he says. He says, Brittany Griner's played one game this year. She's on the team. What I'm saying is this summer... I will not be watching or supporting the American women's team in the Olympics. That's Jerry with a G from Brigantine. So here's the deal. There's two different issues with Jerry brought up. First of all, I first of all give Jerry credit for saying, I saw Caitlin Clark and now I'm watching women's basketball after all those years of not watching. So he does deserve some credit for, you know, coming, coming around a little bit. Look, I've described Caitlin Clark, Nick, many times like Tiger Woods. When Tiger Woods hit the golf world, it wasn't that people weren't watching golf. Is that the majority of people didn't care about golf, right? Right. Tiger Woods elevated the perspective of the sport. To this day, people like my dad, who is not a sports fan, he is not a diehard sports fan like I am at all. But if he knows Tiger Woods is playing a major, Nick... He's watching. He's in. He's right? watching. And that's what Caitlin Clark has done for women's basketball. She has elevated the perspective of the sport. But like Tiger Woods, Caitlin Clark is facing jealousy, resentment, little racial bias, right? You know, a little of this, a little of that, all wrapped in the one. And I do think some of that went into the reason why she's not on the women's team. Because I don't think the world is ready for Caitlin Clark on the women's national team. I think some of these women are still not comfortable with the idea of playing with her. And that's part of the reason they kept her off. But there's another reason why as well. And I have to give Rebecca Lobo credit for this. She brought up that in order to be on the women's national team, you have to be able to have attended a certain number of practices in the offseason, go to a certain number of games, and played in the international game before playing in the Olympics. So I think that that is the real reason why Caitlin Clark... Now, could you have excused that reason? Of course you have. But we have seen this before, Nick. 30 years ago, there was a megastar coming out of college that everyone thought was going to be on the Olympic team, but he was kept off the team. And he used it as motivation to go on to be one of the greatest centers in NBA history. That man is Shaquille O'Neal. Shaquille O'Neal was purposely kept off the dream team because the guys who made the dream team said he didn't earn his stripes. He didn't deserve it. He shouldn't be here. And Shaq went out there and said, bleep all of you and had an amazing career, earned multiple championships, multiple MVPs. And Caitlin Clark said this weekend she is going to use this as motivation. And she has said they have awoken a monster. And I think that... Despite the fact that Jerry G from Brigantine will not be watching the Olympics, I recommend the Jerry G, you watch Caitlin Clark rise because she is going to be like Tiger Woods. She is going to take over and dominate the sport in ways that you have never seen before. And like Shaq, she is going to go out there and destroy everyone for overlooking her. I love it. I, I am total, that's a total thumbs up for me in that response, Josh, because 
Here's why. Like, you can use this as a motivating factor, like you mentioned, because, you know, I, I think you could have excused the practice thing to have her join the team. I think that is something, obviously, they could have done. And if they want eyeballs, they would have had her on the roster. I think that is a fair argument. But what she can do, if you look at this from a positive perspective, from her perspective, use this as motivation. And the, the quote that come out, you've awoken a monster. I think that is going to be huge for her career. I think this is going to be a point in her career where she's like, yeah, you're going to leave me all off the off the women's national team, the USA women's basketball. Uh, yeah, I'm going to go out there and prove to you why I'm going to be on it next time. Right? Use it as a motivating factor. In sports, you're always looking for extra motivation. This should be extra motivation for her in her WNBA career. And I think this is going to really awaken her and you know really show what she can do and what she's made of. I am totally with you on that point, 100%. My third story I want to get to, Nick Earnshaw, Judge Earnshaw for yes. today's big three here on the Sports Bash. Josh Henning filling from Mike Gill on 97.3 ESPN. The third story I want to get to is uh, not from a text board specifically, but something that I heard people bring up over the weekend, right. which is NBA Finals viewership is down. It's down by an average of a million viewers over the course of two games. Now, while game two has peaked at 14 million, so it did go up a little bit, game one was significantly down from last year. On the flip side, the Stanley Cup Finals, Nick, viewership was up 43% with over 7.1 million viewers. It is one of the most viewed Stanley Cup Game 1s since 2019. And a total viewership between uh, television on ABC and digital, it was actually one of the most viewed Stanley Cup final game ones in 30 years. So people might be asking why this is, Nick. And I'm going to tell you why it is. It's because of what channel it's on. I know it sounds dumb, but it's that simple. The Stanley Cup for years was on NBC Sports Network. And most people, the average fan, had no idea what channel that was on. And for many years, Stanley Cup finals tried to go head-to-head with the NBA finals, right? They tried to compete. They tried to say, hockey fans will come out and watch our sport, right? They were wrong. They got killed. They got murdered on the other networks. I mean, the Stanley Cup playoffs at times was on USA Network and MSNBC and CNBC for a time for years. It was the dumbest thing in the world. Finally, they're on a real sports channel, ESPN, ABC. The game was on ABC, on a regular, easy-to-find channel. It wasn't on the same time as anything else. There was nothing else on Saturday night, aside from some UFC fights on ESPN Plus, it wasn't like they were competing with anything. The only the only thing they were competing for was the Dodgers Yankees. That was it. Exactly. And there's a lot of people who just don't care about baseball, right? I'm sorry to say that there are people who just don't care, right? So if you're a sports fan, you just said it: Dodgers Yankees or Stanley Cup Game One. And I think that is a huge reason why it's up so much. I think the reason why the NBA Finals is down: they waited too long. They had too much of a gap between the end of the Eastern Conference Finals and the beginning of the NBA Finals, and I think that is what killed them. You think the momentum of the NBA final, like the momentum of the NBA playoffs, was killed because of the such the long gap between the conference finals and and the NBA finals. I'm I, I think you're right there. I, I think you're right because you were in the full swing of things. The NBA, like you, every night was a big game. You had the Ant Edwards versus Luka Doncic that was going crazy, and then on the Eastern Conference, Boston was just dominating uh, to say the least, and. How many days off do they have? Was it like five or six days? I think it, it was like, six. Yeah, I think it was six days. They started on a Thursday night, and it just kind of killed everything. Like, you forgot, oh, yeah, the final start at the end of the week. Like, I think the time between the conference finals and the NBA finals did probably kill a little bit of the momentum because it felt like every night we were talking about so, like one of the new superstars, right? And that might be the reason why the momentum kind of slowed. And then, you know, with, with Luka Doncic being – and Edwards, you don't really have that same kind of storyline where it's the young player versus the young player who's up next, right? Like you have the Boston Celtics, but they've been good all year. There's not like a ton of storylines there. And the really only one was like Porzingis, all right, is back. He's coming off injury. He had the big game one. 
I, I think that did kill the momentum a little bit. And yeah, the scheduling for, for, uh, for the Stanley Cup, much better going up against just the Yankees and Dodgers for the most part. And you know, it's on an easy channel to access. It's on channel six. So I, it was pretty. Pretty easy and, and great job scheduling. Something Major League Baseball can't really do correctly for also putting the game up against <laughs> the Stanley Cup. Not not great job by them. I so. will say that I don't think baseball tried to go up against Stanley Cup. I no. think it just happened that way. Right. Um, but the Dodgers Yankees, you know, I mean that you got to figure out your scheduling there and it, it interfered with the London series too. I would assume that baseball might have made these schedules before the NBA and NHL announced their schedules. Probably. So I'm going to – I I can't blame baseball too much for that. But I will ask you this, Nick. Do you think that the lack of Kyrie success against Boston has also hurt this series? Like if Kyrie would have come out there and been on fire against Boston, it could have impacted the series viewers. Yeah, I think that's huge, right? Like if Ky- Kyrie going back – to Boston. That is like the big storyline here. Going up, you know, going against the team. You remember he flipped a double bird to yep. the fans before. Behind like, his head. Yes. So. It was pretty funny, actually. That is, that is a huge thing. He has, he has kind of been missing, right? It's kind of been Luca doing it himself for the most part in the first two games. Now, if he had a big game one and got the series off to a roaring start and the Mavs were able to win. Yeah. And then also Boston won game one by a lot. So, yeah. you know, I know Game 2 had more viewership, but, I, I, yeah. I, well, game 2's viewership was up, I believe, it yeah. was 6 million over Game 1. Yeah. Or 5 million or whatever it was. I mean, but, depending on which p- platform you looked at it, it was either 12 or 14 million that peaked yeah. at last night. So, it, it's... It, it's very interesting because game one was so poorly rated and then game two it went right back up. You know, I guess because, you know, you're down at 1 0, maybe Kyrie and Luca come back and it's serious tight. Is up it maybe the not. day too? I mean, I know this sounds silly, but like Sunday night versus Thursday night, is, is there any maybe that involved, you think? Uh, I think so. I think the weekend kind of maybe helped at this. I mean, we saw Stanley Cup numbers up, right? right. On a Saturday and then on a Sunday, numbers up. For the for the NBA Finals, maybe starting on a Thursday, a little goofy, it, very interesting to say the least. Yeah, I'm I'm pulling up the NHL schedule right now because I want to see what other days. I don't have all the sorry, I don't have all the days memorized for the <laughs> Stanley Cup Finals. I'm sorry, um, but I know they play tonight. Okay, but what other days do they play? Uh, so they, so the NHL is going to have tonight, Thursday, and if they need in Game Four would be Saturday. Okay, so. I am going to go out on a limb and say tonight will be good viewership. I think Thursday will wane, and then Saturday will be good again. Back up. Back up again. Yeah, I think you're right. I think think that having the second game, at least within proximity to the first game, will probably help them. But I think this Thursday just feels like such in the middle of the week nothing. (laughs) You know, I mean... In June. Well, not just that, but also like, you know... There, there's a chunk of this viewership are people who go out to like bars and establishment right. to watch games. I have been told many times by people who own bars and establishments, getting people to come out on a Thursday night is hard. Yeah. That it, it is not a good night historically to get people to come out. So, you know, maybe we're just busy that night. You know, maybe that night is just not a good night. It's a work um, night. Hello. Right. You know, you're working the next day. Yep. Maybe you got plans. I mean, now here's the other thing. How does school being out soon impact things? You know, like, I don't, I don't know. Like, are people more inclined with their kids to stay up? Are they more inclined to do other things with their kids? You know, does Thursday come into us plan for the weekend day? Like, I just feel like Thursday is not a great sports watching night in general. Yeah, I, it's, it's a weird night, I think, to start the finals. I, you know, if you started it earlier in the week, early on, like a Tuesday, I think that would make more sense. Then you have the second game later on in the week, and then the third game heading into the weekend. I think that would make more sense than starting it on a Thursday heading into the weekend. A little odd, but, you know, you start it on a Sunday, That that's a, that, I think that's a good spot, too. That's why the viewership was up, because, you know, everyone's kind of home. They're getting ready for work the next day. That makes sense. Yeah, Thursday's just an odd day to start it. He's Nick Earnshaw. I'm Josh Hennig filling in for Mike Gill here on 97.3 ESPN. As we far, I've, I've not got any updates to the contrary, but as I've been told, Mike Gill is en route. He is either back in America now or he's <laughs> almost back in America now. He will be back on the Sports Bash tomorrow. We'll wrap up the hour coming up next, and then Nick Earnshaw will drive you home for the power hour known as game night here on 97.3 ESPN FM, 97.3 ESPN, mobile app powered by First Bank of Seattle City.
What's the easiest choice you can make? Window instead of middle seat? Picking a vendor who sends a great gift basket? Outsourcing business tasks you hate? What about selling with Shopify? Whether you're selling a little or a lot, Shopify helps you do your thing, however you cha-ching. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. From the launch your online shop stage to the first real-life store stage, all the way to the did we just hit a million orders stage, Shopify is there to help you grow. Whether you're selling scented soap or offering outdoor outfits, Shopify helps you sell. Wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash try. Go to shopify.com slash try now to grow your business, no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash try. The Sports Bash with Mike Gill on 97.3 ESPN and the free mobile app. All right, wrapping up the Sports Bash here on 97.3 ESPN, along with Nick Earnshaw, I am Josh Hennig. Uh, I did think it was funny. CM from Sicklerville chimed in. Yeah. Says, as someone who has caught the wrath of Mike Gill's rebuttals <laughs> over the years, Josh, I have to say, that was maybe the best reply I've ever heard on the Sports Bash. You killed that guy. That's from CM in Sicklerville. That, see, he's right because I was stunned after that. You gave like detailed, in-depth analysis on gymnastics. And then you, and then we learned, we learned something about Josh Henning after that too. Like it was the perfect response to, uh, to, to that question and to that text. Listen, I, I just gotta tell you guys, look, I, I know my, my gymnastics, man, you know. <laughs> yeah, I know. You I mean, know. I know Simone Biles is the greatest of all time, but you could argue that Nastia Lukin is number two. Oh Dominique God. Dawes is number three, probably. Shannon Miller's number four. Why don't, why don't you start a gymnastics podcast or that something? That would I never would, gain traction. Be, it would be a, a, a kind of a niche, you know. That's a podcast. super niche. Super, super niche. I'd rather go back to doing podcasts about Marvel and DC movies and shows. Okay. That's see, I, I can, you know, maybe I'll be a guest if you bring that one back. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be a guest on it, Josh. Speaking of guests, Nick, who do you have coming up on uh, game night? Yeah, so we have a lot of fun. Joe Von Alford from Fanside. He chimed in a little early today to, to the Sports Bash uh, from Fanside. He will join me at 625, so looking forward to that. We're going to talk Phil's. Talk, I want to talk about Emundo Sosa and Trey Turner a little bit. That's going to be an interesting dynamic when uh, when he comes back. So that'll be fun. Sixers Outlook as well. We'll get to some birds as too. All right, Nick, I appreciate your help today. I appreciate you uh, making my life a little easier today (laughs) by coming in and helping out and doing yeoman's work over there. Appreciate it. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Next time we do this, we will do a top 10 sports movies and compare notes. Oh, definitely. That's got to happen. I'm already ready to go. I I have some takes on the movies. I'm sure Mike Gill will be having a day off or two this summer (laughs) that you and I can co-host again together. That sounds good. That sounds good to me. We'll have a lot of fun. It's been fun uh, filling in on the Sports Bash the past two days, last Friday as well. We anticipate back to business as normal tomorrow. Tomorrow's Mike Gill has either landed or landing in America as we speak. And I'll be back tomorrow on the Sports Bash. I'm Josh Hennig. Have a great day, everybody. Nick Earnshaw fills in on game night next.